Good morning and welcome to another Scraps and Scrolls. Welcome to the Isle of Faces. Welcome again to the ever-gathering end of Dance of Dragons. We are getting there. Next week is when we're really, really going to feel it, but we get a little bit of that today as well. We know it's building. We know it's all going to get to something very, very big, and we're waiting to go through it. Hello, thank you for coming back. I am Sir Buckley, your resident green person here on the Isle, ready to take you through these four chapters, ready to talk tangents and main plot lines, and probably swear at you a bit if Peter Baelish comes up. All that good stuff that you like to hear. And I thank you, of course, once again for joining me. How very kind of you. I'm speaking to you from a, a cold England, a cold isle. Winter is trying to break through. It's trying very hard out the window as we speak to snow, which is quite in keeping with one of our chapters today. It was definitely bloody cold this morning on the dog walk, let me tell you. But perhaps the weather just really, really knows what we're getting to here. Drifting ever closer to those winds of winter. And these chapters certainly are doing their best effort to keep with the moment as well. Now, if you've been listening to recent episodes, you'll know we've had a lot to cover. We had a three hour and 50 minute episode. That was followed by a three hour and 30 minute episode. It's most definitely a sign of the big moment we're in in the series. There is so much going on. That's not really going to change today. If I had to guess, I don't think we're going to reach those lengths, although I could very easily be proven wrong. But then there's just a little bit less to cover today. We have the shortest chapter of the book included. So you'd think logistically, not going to happen, but that doesn't mean it's any less important. We've got some big, big stuff, so don't you worry. But of course, in conjunction with episodes of that length, as you might guess, it means an awful lot of work. Very, very long hours hours of effort to put this all together uh, i'm not saying that just so you'll get some sympathy for me or to toot my own horn yet again i'm only saying it because it's all worth it you guys make it worth it because you're still sending in messages you're still doing the downloads and listening first off you're sharing on twitter you're liking on twitter and getting some lovely lovely comments just interesting comments discussion about the episodes which is what we really want so i'm going to thank you all there's too many of you to list this time around but really that keeps it going that's what we want here in the aisle more and more interaction more and more discussion that'll help the podcast grow it help the fandom grow in its own little way we just like to see more of that so please do keep it up i know i'm not always the quickest at replying to you so if you are waiting don't worry i'll get you but in the meantime keep sending talk amongst yourselves there's plenty of you here on the aisle and it's just wonderful to see and again i think that's obvious because we're covering such good discussion worthy content right here at the end there's so much to think about and cover and everything like that but it honestly is brilliant so thank you all for all doing your part and of course there's some obvious people i need to thank on top of aziz and Cher, still working away still ahead of us over on the Sundays and Valor Aurelius and the live streams. I know you're already catching up with them. I don't need to tell you about that. But also, I must thank our beloved patrons, each and every single one of you, for your continued support. And again, your messages and everything else. But specifically, I must thank Egan the Six, Lord Commander, Namian Darkling, KM, and Archmaster June, healer of the Lesser Poxes, who really has been sending him some awesome analysis of late like i mentioned last week that's that's still going she's got lots of thoughts lots of things to cover and i'm lucky enough to get to read them all so thank you to all of you for that if anyone out there listening on the public stream would like to come and look at the patron and see if it's something for you fantastic we've got some great people over there they'd be happy to welcome you as would i if it's not for you absolutely fine we don't mind at all everybody's welcome on now we're all here to discuss our love of these books and these specific chapters so i'll say again even though i should really set a time and just say it every 10 minutes or so thank you to our patrons Thank you to everyone for listening. Now, there's not actually that much to cover before we get into the chapters today. I'll give you another reminder to check out the Radio Restros Discord, where it's just got everything you could ever imagine all under one roof. A Song of Ice and Fire, non A Song of Ice and Fire, nerdy, non-nerdy. It's got everything in there you really can't miss. Get rid of the Twitter machine, you don't need that, it's just bad vibes everywhere. Head over to Radio Rest Discord instead because everyone's brilliant, so much discussion, again, about anything you can think of. The 20 questions games alone are worth your time, so I encourage you to check that out. And then, on top of that, I don't think there's anything else to say other than things I probably should remind you of more, such as keep your masks on, don't go outside unless you need to. For my friends here in England, we're still under lockdown, don't get lax, this is no time to get lax people are still dying yes numbers are falling thankfully let's praise the skies for such a blessing but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet people are still dying we need to be vigilant we need to do our best so keep that up for people like Archmaster june and everyone else all the other healthcare workers and all the other people out there suffering we've lost or might lose family members and friends like that so do not get lax that is an order from the aisle now that's pretty much all out of the way we can get going today because it is another four big chapters. Again, I don't think they quite match the importance of the last eight we've covered or so, but that doesn't mean there's not some big, big moments. And let me tell you what some of those might be with what we're doing today. We'll start with probably the biggest, John 12. 
the wildlings come through the wall. I don't think that needs any further explanation of how big an event that is. It is huge. There is lots to talk about that. And there's actually way more in that chapter than you'd think. So we'll get to that. Then we leave Westeros for a little bit. We go for the double marine chapters because we have our second Barristan chapter, The Discarded Knight, where we're really going to cover the kind of political fallout of Daenerys leaving and what's going to happen now going forward, much more than we've got so far. And then finally, 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 we have Quentin Free, the spurned suitor. It's been so, so long since we've seen him, or since we've been in his POV at least, so we've got lots to cover there. And again, he's also got to cover, okay, what am I going to do next? Well, we know what that is, so that's very exciting to cover. That's got some great lines in it. And then actually, we're doing double trouble in terms of long-time reunions for our purposes, because after an even longer gap, we have John Connington too, the Griffin Reborn. Yes, we're actually headed to the Stormlands of all places, we're headed to Griffin's Roost to see the beginning of the invasion of Aegon Targaryen and his forces. That is a brilliant chapter. I'm really looking forward to covering that one with you. So let's delay no further here. Let's get on. We'll begin with Up at the Wall, Up in the North, John 12. So if we're going to start off a podcast, this seems to be the way to do it. Could there really be a more significant beginning, a larger event for us to cover right from the off? Well, no, not really, because here comes the big day. The biggest day this part of the world has seen in 8,000 years, if you want to believe the histories. In certain ways, you can even say that this is bigger than Aegon's conquest or the Andal invasion, both of which kind of faltered at the neck and never really came to the north and were very slow and even trying to anyway. Whereas what we get today is the largest influx of people the north has ever seen, especially in this manner, is an upset to its largest long-standing social structure the one that we know is so important the one that we've discussed lots this is a complete flip of the table as far as important events go you are really really hard pressed to try and top this so we're kicking off the fireworks extremely early here today on the podcast and while it's true we don't really get to see this reaching the true north yet what we have today it would theoretically come true at some point maybe in the series maybe after and it is no less chaotic for the night's watch or the wildlings themselves this is the biggest change coming to either of these parties in their entire existence or at least since the war went up in terms of the wildlings this is as we've said so many times is one of the true staples of the world that george has introduced us to as sure as essos lies in the east dawn is hot or water is wet this is what the wall is for apparently that's what everyone takes it for anyway to keep the wildlings out now they are coming through so that structure that social structure the things that everyone's just sure of these are the facts is being taken down again the paradigm is definitely shifting very very drastically now the world is changing which is an easy sentence to say but consider what it truly means for these people living in this world in this society and as it happens our boy john is stood right in the middle of it and if we want some mirror talk and you know we do this is his equivalent to Danny's storm deeds and her taking down of the slavery structure over in Slaver's Bay. That was a complete breaking of how the world is supposed to work in that area, of how things have apparently always been. And you can even make the argument this case is even more ancient and eternal. Now obviously we know slavery has been around quite a while, but that specific structure of Slaver's Bay probably isn't as old and as central as the wall is to the north and to Westeros and we're lacking some of that magical element. Or maybe we're not, but that's how it seems anyway. So we obviously have this real focus on the past, given that something very, very old is changing forever, is completely different now. But let's also think about the future, because this is the biggest ever step in preparing for the big fight, if you think about it. The big fight, by which I mean the overall plot, man versus the others, humanity versus total annihilation, the point of the books. In this chapter today, we are taking 4,000 souls out of the hands of the others and placing them on the side of the living. Nothing that's been done so far, other than maybe the needed gaining of knowledge, most of which was achieved by accident, is as important. This is the biggest step to the unpayable debt of the fist of the first men. This is the first real blow for the chances of the others. And though we can easily imagine it all falling apart, and might even get a hint of that at the end of the chapter, right here on the day is beyond monumental. It is a win for humanity the first one they've really got to be honest and as we've seen in recent chapters or to be honest all chapters in this book john has always used that as his finishing point with his many arguments you know why we're doing this everybody is to save humanity is to prepare for this big fight but really we know that this today is something more core to him he's saving lives when you get down to it that is his true mission and no he's not going to save all of them 
And yes, some of the ones who survive today might not survive that much longer. But overall, he is saving lives. He's saving a people. And that comes in the form of bodies, of customs, of history, and whatever else would have disappeared into nothingness if they had been left above the wall. John is just the ultimate force for good. And he's obeying his oaths. He's protecting people, just like a true Stark. Really, what is John but a human Winterfell right now? That is the purpose of Winterfell. We've said it many, many times. Now John is doing the exact same thing, just a little bit further north. And this, as much as anything, is the legacy of Ned Stark and his efforts as a father having an effect on the world. I know there's a good many people out there like to have a bit of parent bashing when it comes to Ned. I don't see it personally. Instead, I see John taking Ned's lessons on protecting a people, what it means to be a leader, what it means to be a lord or whatever else, and extrapolating that out to the biggest possible mission, the biggest possible way you can show off those ideals. I see Ned all over this and well it's wonderful let's give praise to john throughout this chapter even with all the potential pitfalls and all the drama we had in this last chapter and actually getting to this point when it comes down to it he is being awesome he is the hero and all of the, what we get in this chapter is in keeping with john as a person and with his arc that we've seen play out not just throughout this book but really the whole series the whole thing has been leading to this moment remember the prologue of a game of thrones was designed to make us aware of this ethereal, otherworldly threat, this ghostly thing that we had no idea what it was. But the actual plot of that prologue was about Mance Raider and what he was up to. So you go from that to Benjen and him trying to find things out, to the Great Ranging, to Corrin Halfhand, to John's time with the Wildlings and Egret, to the battles at the Wall, to John's dance arc, and that's all been building towards this one moment it's actually a bit surprising to sum it up like that and to look back and really realize how yeah this has all been one river charging down flowing down into this one point as wide as the gate of the wall and though it's definitely not the end of said arc and there's definitely not an end to their many many problems but it is a gigantic symbol it is a huge day and it is just amazing to think of the plot coming together like that of this paying off of everything we've seen right from the beginning it's a tentpole and to be honest it's kind of strange to actually see it to actually have it here on the page and we get to be present for such times right on the ground when you can't really when you're actually reading this chapter realize what a big deal it is and that's just so far remember when we actually get to the end of the series we're probably going to know this to be even more significant it also goes a long way to the build-up and extreme tension that we've been feeling in recent john chapters especially that last one like i say we know this decision is being ill received by several parties that john is not as popular as we might like and that the arc is going to close soon so something big is going to have to happen and this page is getting thinner and thinner every week we know that the book is ending soon and with what happens today it's really anyone's guess but we just have that increased sense of grand importance the air is full of suspense and we'll go over in this chapter how george gets that across and he keeps us on the line throughout as for the actual content of the chapter not only do we have this grand event and all its logistics we also have a tying back to the stories of old as we keep seeing in these closing chapters when we revisit the horn of draman and the original plan of mance raider we have a dire update from cotter pike to remind us that even though this is the more symbolic happening at castle black and it also being an agreed upon event there is a similar critical attempt going on elsewhere and finally here before we actually get into the text let's be aware that this is the second to last john chapter all that remains after this is the one and i know you know what i mean there so that's going to be very very difficult to actually get to and read again and talk through but that is coming up and after this we actually have the biggest john gap of the entire book we've spoken about that lots how john and danny take these gaps at the end this is a 10 chapter gap between john 12 and 13 his largest previously was a couple of seven chapter gaps much earlier in the book so this is something monumental that's obviously by design from george as everything else wraps up so we get that peak, that high, high peak of drama right at the very end there. So I think that also lends something to just how monumental a moment this is that we can have a 10 chapter gap after it. But that's enough talk. Let's actually get into it because there is a lot to cover. Because even with the grand moment, even with the grand plot and everything that goes along with that, what we actually start with before we even get to that main event is a dream. We're no stranger to John dreams, even if they aren't so numerous in dances with other books, but this one is one of the most important we see from him, one of the most telling, at least that's how it looks to us right now. And it's a poignant dream, both for its content, 
John defending the wall against the wildlings he's about to let through said wall, but also just for the timing. This is a grand day that will make ripples through history and all possible futures, so perhaps the significance of this event is what sends a significant dream to go along with it. As if they are linked, or as if John needs to have this dream right now. Maybe that's of importance that it comes on this specific night. Now in fairness, even without the actual waking events of the day to still to come, this dream would really stand out to us because it seems to be one of our best ever descriptions or hints or glances at what might be the end game of the series or something close to it or at least how John relates to it the defense of the wall against the army of the dead that's what it looks like maybe that's not what it means maybe that's not what it represents but that on first look is how it seems to us and again I'll say it this is what the series is about it doesn't get any bigger than that this is the point of the series you can see how we're moving into the final arc here how dance is really trying to signify that to us the end of dance specifically and as we've already mentioned this is what the whole chapter is about so you can see how sleeping and waking events are so linked up here and they really do buoy the importance of this dream up and let's, let's break it down properly now because it does deserve our due attention we open with this line that night he dreamt of wildlings howling from the woods advancing to the moan of war horns and the roll of drums so at first take you could be persuaded that this is just john simply remembering the battle for the wall from storm of swords we saw wild things pouring from the woods back then. This has happened, so maybe his mind is just reliving that and forcing him to think on the fact that he once fought against the people that he's now saving. Or, if you want to go a bit further, especially for an opening line, you might even imagine that John is having a premonition here and we could take this as a sign that Torment will renege on the deal and actually come out swinging, even if the logistics of who is actually left in Torment's band puts that to bed pretty quickly. I suppose we could think it was the Weeper. We're obviously going to find out in a moment that's not the case, but you could think that on first time reading. Although those ideas do tend to drift away pretty quickly, I would think, as you continue to read. The next line is a description of the drum beats that bring the wildlings out in their attack. And we know George always loves the drums being part of a particularly doom-filled or important moment. But I'd like to point out that the particular writing device George is using here, boom, doom, boom, doom, and so on, I bring that up because that particular description of drums, those actual words, have been brought up twice before, literally written out like that, boom, doom, boom, doom. First was at the Red Wedding. Take that as you will. That was the pounding that dominated Catelyn's mind just before it all went down. The second was more recent. It was in the Ghost of Winterfell chapter, where Theon is sat by the heart tree, listening to what he thinks is Stannis. And then we have it here. That's the only three times that's mentioned in that specific way, so perhaps that's a signal of importance. For whatever it's worth, Catelyn's description didn't have the capitalization. We have boom always capitalized in this case and in Fion's. Now, does that mean anything? I don't know. I'll let you decide, but I'm pointing that out anyway. After the description of those drums, we get this. A thousand hearts with a single beat. That's the addendum on the end of those drums. And at first glance, it probably means nothing to us. But as we get a few lines lower and start seeing that John's enemy is not wild things at all, that line takes on a bit more significance. This can be a clue that what he's looking at are whites, all bodies controlled by a singular being or an other or a Night King figure, whatever it is going to be. To go with that, the next sentence is others riding chariots of made of bone. Now I'm having a bit of fun here and I'm suggesting that this is supposed to tell us that there are others including in this because the word is capitalised but that's obviously because it's the first word in the sentence. Still I can see why people would latch on and I can imagine George having a bit of a chuckle at that. After the description of giants and other wild things coming for him it's John now standing atop the wall ordering to feed them flame. So that's our second clue because we know what type of enemy requires the feeding of flame to defeat them especially as we start to get some real Fist of the First Men flashbacks in this dream. But then we learn that John is alone atop the wall. He is him alone trying to defend the world. And this seems like a key idea to tap into. There is one man defending on the wall, when on this waking day, John is inviting thousands to come and join him in that defence. The wall won't have seen this many people upon it in centuries, maybe even longer. So what has happened to all of them? Does it signify that this plan will all come to ruin? That those other castles will fail and both wildlings and brothers will either die or abandon their duty? Do they all kill each other off? Do they go back on the deal? Is John abandoned by his brothers? Is that what this is supposed to say? Does this merely signify that they have all already died in defending the wall and John is just the last man standing? That all his efforts as Lord Commander, including the big one in the waking day, weren't enough? It's all possibilities. Next quote. There was no one to pay heed. They are all gone. They have abandoned me. So John is saying, no, it's not defeat, it's abandonment. It's a straight-up choice they've made. We could guess this is his mind processing the background worries he has about mutinies and how people are thinking of him and Bowen Marsh calling him a traitor in his most recent chapter and all those very real concerns. Maybe this is just how they are coming out in his subconsciousness while John tries to ignore them in his actual conscious form. 
or the idea might be of John feeling alone in his current efforts. So many people argue against him in Bowen and Celise and probably Melisandre by now, etc, etc, the list goes on. It feels like he alone is actually trying to save people and win this war, while everyone else is just making trouble and complaining and not having their proper priorities in place. We know he does have his supporters, sure, and Stannis is at least semi-aligned in the same purpose, but we also do know how lonely it feels for Jon in that purpose. And just in general as well, let's not forget the Kill the Boy theme hasn't gone anywhere, even if we're not talking about it as much. John is a lonely man. Or we can take it as a message that only you can do it, John, that type of idea. It must be you leading the charge when it really comes down to it. In crunch time, the world is going to look to you. Now, Everybody out there knows I'm a big supporter of the Team Azor High theory and that role being filled by multiple people. I think we all expect Danny to have a pretty major role, but there's many, many ideas, isn't there? Still, that doesn't mean that Jon can't have one of, if not the major role in protecting the world. His arc is certainly more than set up for that, isn't it? Or maybe this is even just being really literal. Other heroes will play their certain parts in certain places, but for Jon, it will be defending the wall. Maybe that will remain his duty. Now, let's return to the action because we've only made it to the second paragraph. Enemies are now sending their own burning arrows up to the top of the wall. Hmm, that sounds a bit odd because we don't remember the wild things using burning arrows and obviously the whites can't. So I wonder if this imagery of black cloaks ablaze is supposed to be a symbol of either Jon or the Night's Watch coming into conflict against Daenerys and her dragons. Or maybe the others capture a dragon and use it against them. It's very possible. Or there might be another idea to discuss, but we'll come back to that one in just a moment. For now, another quote. Snow, an eagle cried, as foemen scuttled up the ice like spiders. And, and this is very telling, isn't it? An eagle, as we've seen before, is associated with warging. And being called Snow all the time is kindred with Mormont's raven and others as well, who we normally believe to be connected to Blood Raven. Now, in a minute, we'll see that specific raven shouting Snow to wake John up. So maybe this is just the old trope of a dreamer hearing a part of the waking world, or maybe it's hinting that Blood Raven will be part of this and of John's future. And maybe this is what his ultimate plan is, and hopefully for the good. But then maybe we take it as evidence of Bran being involved as well. Maybe he is an eagle. Maybe he and John are teaming up to take on this ultimate threat. Maybe John is not as alone as he thinks. Although, why Bran would call John Snow instead of John is a legit question, but it gets your mind working. Or maybe you just want to go the much simpler route and believe that this is John just remembering Aurel and his eagle that came for his face before. What about the second half? Coming up the ice like spiders. Well, come on now, you know we're going to like this. We've been waiting to see this particular apparition since Old Nan's first tales of the Long Night way back when, and they've not appeared on page yet. So it seems George is keeping them close to his chest until the others really start making their play. He wants to keep his monsters until crunch time, basically. And that is what's being indicated here. It's another clue of what type of enemy John is actually facing. These clearly aren't wildlings. He's facing the others. He's facing whites. But the big lines keep on coming. This next one might be the biggest yet. John was armoured in black ice, but his blade burned red in his fist. Right, yeah. See, big lines. Let's break it down. So firstly, black ice. What does that mean? Does that mean the frozen fire of Valerian steel? Is this Euron's armour that Jon has got somehow? Is it a reference to the White Walkers in general? Or is it just that Jon has both ice and fire in his armour and sword, respectively, to represent his two great bloodlines? Perhaps he's wearing some official armour of the Night's Watch. Remember once years ago, Sam bought loads of armour, but it wasn't black, so they didn't let him have it. Or perhaps is it a hint to another idea that I'm still going to ask you to keep in your mind? I'm going to come back to this one in a second. We'll do that one at the end. We can't help but make the comparisons between a blade burning red and the idea of what Lightbringer is supposed to be. No, Lightbringer isn't supposed to burn, but heat burning, you get the connection. So we're also making those connections with Azor High again, whether we want to place that solely on John's shoulders as a person and a role to play, or just to signify that this dream is detailing the absolute end events, the really important ones. Perhaps somewhere in the future, this is a sign that John learns the fire sword trick of Beric and Foros, but maybe a true version rather than a trick. Maybe that's something that Melisandre does for him like she does in the show. Maybe it's something that comes to him because he's due to return to life as a fire white, or maybe it's just a symbol of the fury of which he must fight now which the next big line details for us they just keep coming as the dead men reached the top of the wall he sent them down to die again so george is moving past subtlety now john is fighting dead men he's fighting the whites they look like wildlings because the grand majority of the other's army is going to look like wildlings they used to be wildlings they are the civilization to be utterly destroyed and corrupted by evil even if john's efforts to save as many as possible are successful today so now John's world minimises to just cutting down the enemies in front of him and protecting the wall and therefore the world. 
He kills old and young, man and woman. He thinks he kills Egret and Donald Noy and Corin Halfhand and Death Dick Follard. Now, none of those people are coming back as whites, we already know that. So the dream might be one of foretelling and of purpose and destiny, but John's own emotions and history are mixed in there as well, as he kills people who meant a lot to him and were major parts of his life, which, all right, is a bit of a promotion for Death Dick, but you get the idea. You can see the roles those other people played in his life. And perhaps it's worth noting that three of those died all in the same battle, the pre-fight before Mance arrived, save for Corin, obviously, he was much before that. So I suppose maybe it's a surfacing of John's guilt in a way, although it's again strange that Dick is included. Perhaps it's just a general remorse. We see those roles, the mentor, the lover, a comrade maybe. I wonder if that's hinting at who he might have to kill in the future, or other people who currently fill those roles may be becoming whites somewhere down the line. That might be possible. Then it all becomes way more personal for John, as it's Rob who appears. Rob who he takes down as he screams that he is Lord of Winterfell. So we're really delving into the deep issues now. The ones that might resurface when John comes back to life, if he is more basic and instinctual and angry and dark, maybe like we've wondered. Maybe those deep issues do come right back up to the surface. And it's worth noting that he does mention Longclaw that time around. So we seem to start off very Azor High heavy, very Destiny related before it slowly becomes more personal for John at the end. And here's where I'll link back those several ideas that I asked you to think of. So we had John armoured in black ice. We had fire arrows coming against him when normally they're supposed to go the other way. I wonder if this dream in some way is supposed to either signify or make us think that John might end up on another side from what we think. Is he going to be associated with the others in some way? Is he going to go over to that side in some way and join their ranks or do something like it is that why he's armored in ice is that why there's fire arrows coming against him and is that why he's moving against winterfell is he corrupted in some way again we don't know how he's going to come back is that going to play into it we probably think not but there seems to be hints throughout not just here but throughout the series that maybe that is going to happen some people do think it will so perhaps there's just some element being uncovered here. Either way, the dream ends now as a gnarled hand seizes John and turns him round. Now of course, we never see who that is, but there are a few decent candidates, of course. We've already mentioned Blood Raven. He seems to be the most likely, and if you're going to have a, a gnarled hand, then a guy who's half a tree, he seems like a pretty likely candidate. It could be Bran. Maybe it's future Bran, where he is all gnarled as well. I like the idea that it could be Benjen. I've even seen it said that it could be Dywin. The man apparently still out there beyond the wall somewhere. A man who can smell others and who has been described as gnarled before in the text. So maybe it could be any of them. I really like the Benjamin one just because I miss Benjamin. But I think I'd probably land on Blood Raven. Either way, now it's the Raven waking him, shouting snow again. Whether he's doing that because he's aware that John is having the important dream and is all worked up about it, or doesn't want John to see it, the, see the ending for whatever reason. Maybe it's the messing with destiny stuff. Or is he just trying to get across extra information about it? We don't know. Either way, it's a pretty important beginning that really gets you thinking. And we're not even off the first page yet. That was all about five paragraphs worth. There's a lot of interesting lines in there. Like I said, a lot to consider overall and much theory crafting to be done. And it again lends gravitas to the chapter and the growing of John's arc. It's all just getting really important, isn't it? We're breaking the paradigm. We're getting full on glimpses of probably the end of the series. Some of our clearest glimpses ever. For all the extra thought we can put into it, this probably is just a sign of John being the hero and defending the world and being the dragon and embracing fire and whatever else i personally really like that idea of stark bloodline being his armor his targaryen bloodline being his weapon i just quite like that imagery but whatever it might be we're really really on the high peak now and that was just the dream that doesn't have any effect on the actual day we've still got this chapter to cover we have this quote the day had come it was the hour of the wolf oh you bet it is john don't you forget it and so that's just further lending to the moment it, the it's all come to this kind of idea in the clarity slash cloudiness of waking John has a moment where the weight of the day actually hits him. This is huge, this is life-changing, and it seems too big for just one young man to weather on his own. So we tie back to the beginning now, as John suffers a bit of imposter syndrome, and believes that other, older men from earlier in the story, old names that we haven't seen for ages, should have been doing this instead of him. No, no, John, you sell yourself short. Dual Mormont would have probably been an abysmal choice for this, and Dennis Malister as well. True, we probably would put all our money behind Benjen, perhaps because of him just being brought up in that dream, but they are not here. They have not done this thing, John has, and he's willing to wake up and put that weight on his shoulders once more again now. Every choice had its risk, every choice its consequences. He would play the game to its conclusion. It's drama, it's getting us ready. No one is expecting this to be clean sailing. There will be issues, there will be problems. First timers are guessing, rereaders know. Also, just that talk of conclusion, of reaching an ending, it just fits into us, doesn't it? It adds into this whole sense of this part of the book, as well as the series, we are supposed to be entering that new act of A Song of Ice and Fire overall. So that dream definitely has the sense of conclusion going, as will this chapter and what that actually happens in it. Next quote, this time coming from The Raven. 
King and Snow, John Snow, John Snow. That was queer. The bird had never said his full name before, as best John could recall. So talk about signs. Things are changing. Things are becoming clearer. We are moving along. And now our minds really start worrying about how this can work in conjunction with that dream. Is the raven, whether it be blood ravens or brands, trying to get across, hey, pay attention to that dream. This is what you need to do. Look, I'm even saying your full name, so you actually pay attention because this is really important. You really need to focus here. Jon Snow, Jon Snow, King. Of course, John does not think that. He just gets on with his day. He doesn't even reference the fact that the bird says king. And I think most people believe that to be a sign that John will become king or needs to become king. Is that of the North, of Westeros, of the Wildlings? That's probably a debate for another time, isn't it? For now, he's just focused on giving 100% to the day ahead of him. And you can hardly blame him for that, but it's probably infuriating for both the raven and its handler, and us as well in a way. The tension of the day is set up over breakfast, not just in the overall wow what are we doing sense, but for what might actually happen, because for first timers we might be thinking, oh the big moment of the book of the arc is going to happen here. They don't know John is going to get stabbed at the end, they might be thinking, oh this is the chapter, this is the big drama, something's going to go wrong, and George is going to play on that suspicion all the way through. Note that Burr Marsh uses specific language, if the wildlings uphold the bargain, it will go as you've commanded so he wants to get across that this is a deal that he does not approve or believe in surprise surprise yet for all that he is doing his job so we can't knock him too much besides john knows the truth of it run wrong move and it means blood and carnage for everyone so in typical john fashion which is to say empathetic and smart he gets across how it feels for the other side it's an even bigger day for them than it is the night's watch this needs to be a team effort both sides meeting each other in the middle it's not a victory or a demonstration from the night's watch it's everybody coming together most importantly if it does go wrong it will be for something out of our hands the night's watch will not start a fight under any circumstances and if we do the perpetrators will be subject to john's already proven brand of justice so we love John putting his foot down and using his authority for such good purposes. We love him thinking about things from a point of view other than his own, which is a good lesson for the characters here, just as it is for us and the real world. We don't know how much it sinks in with these nods and muttered words from the men of the Night's Watch. We're just going to be on edge from here on out in terms of John's position within his own institution, thanks to the building of his arc and again, Burr Marsh's words last time. But they do get up and they do do their duty, so we'll take what we can get. John will go into this with all best intentions, but it remain to be seen if it'll actually go well. I think there is a sense of George trying to replicate near identical emotions and tensions to Danny's last chapter in Marine. They're very, very comparable for two chapters, aren't they? We're almost expecting something to go down here because it does seem so likely, as we say. So George is toying and playing red herring with us slightly by pushing that break back to John's next chapter instead, but it definitely works here for a first time reading experience. To distract us further, we turn the good vibes back up because Ed Tullett is back. We didn't think we'd see him again, so that's pretty great news. He's here to take the incoming spear eyes back to Longbarrow, which has been unfortunately renamed by some of the more idiotic and infantile men, but still, Ed is Ed, and we get some of his trademark humour to lighten the day. We also find out that Iron Emma is sleeping with Black Maris, a spear wife, or that's heavily implied anyway. So it looks like temptation does prove too much for mere oaths for some. And we can view that as a good sign or we could view it as bad. For now we have to wonder if this particular storyline or this hint of one will come back to bite in some way. Does it hint that those away from John's eye will do as they will? Is Iron Emmett sleeping on the job you could say? Is that all going to come into chaos at some point? Is he going to make the wrong decision? Is John going to come down on him for breaking those oaths if that sterner John does come back from the dead? We can only really guess here but... You never know, it might figure it's important. Either way, it is interesting to see that there's someone called Nettles because, well, we like that name, don't we, for the larger A Song of Ice and Fire lore. John continues to try and set the good vibes by looking at the decent weather, though Ed disagrees and takes it as a bad sign. John says, well, at least it's not snowing, but all that does is keep us wondering. We have tension between wildlings and brothers, sure, but what if a sudden snow were to come? What if the others were to make their move now, when both sides are at their most vulnerable and the most chaos would ensue? Is that what that dream was supposed to be hinting at, that they're coming now, right, right here? Was it premonition after all? Just imagine the situation. That long line of wildlings making their way through the gate and the others and their white army shows up. Ugh, it's horrible to even picture. Some of the wildlings bolting back to the woods, some rushing at the gate, a stampede pandemonium there, the brothers of the Night's Watch getting back behind the gate and fighting to seal it off, leaving both wildlings and brothers out there to be killed and then turned. Ugh, no, it's not good, and it's very close to what we think will be the hard home situation. That would obviously be devastating both in result and actually having to watch it play out, so George is really playing for our expectations. We, again, know something is coming at the end of this arc. The wall will weep indeed. We just don't know when. 
John will be personally heading out beyond the wall to make sure everything goes smoothly, and in doing so we have more talk on the trappings of power. Today it is important to buy into such concepts, not to prove some kind of victory or rub anyone's face in it or try and establish some sort of dominion, but in the pursuit of peace. Many wildlings that come through will just be glad to get on the other side of the wall, but as pointed out before, some of the hate runs deep. Some of them have legitimate gripes with the Night's Watch, and therefore some will be looking for a crack. Whether that be to take revenge, or just to get out of the deal, or to run away, or anything else, it almost doesn't matter. John knows that the best way to deal with such problems isn't in a reactive stance, but a proactive one. If he can give the impression of an iron rule in terms of someone not to mess with, but also someone or something worth buying into, a show of strength for he knows how the minds of the free folk work, it will save lives and it will save John specifically from having to do any unfortunate justice. The first trapping is finding an impressive horse. Second is having his biggest contingent of guards yet. It's mentioned again how he doesn't like having a tail, that's been brought up before, and it's an obvious setup of irony for what happens in his last chapter. For now he chooses eight of his most impressive. Just having them there will do a lot of the work, but he's also clever in choosing levers to send a message to the newcomers that they are welcome, that they can find a place here, they can ride high. For many, they will be too stuck in their ways and their prejudices to ever change or take notice of such, but every mind that John can change, or even just reassure, is a huge victory and it has a rippling out effect amongst the wildlings as a people. John thinks he sees Melisandre watching them as they're about to leave, and we still haven't been told how this news has been received by her, but we've got a pretty good guess. Selyse hasn't bothered to show up or offer help at all. Even though Stannis is pro on this choice, she's letting the Night's Watch do it themselves. It's quite the message sent. There's no time for worrying about such, though. Now we have to enter the actual moment. Here's the quote for you, at length. Open the gate, Jon Snow said softly. Open the gate! Big Little roared. His voice was thunder. Seven hundred feet above, the sentries heard and raised their war horns to their lips. The sound rang out, echoing off the wall and out across the world. Aoom! One long blast. For a thousand years or more, that sound had meant rangers coming home. Today, it meant something else. Today, it called the free folk to their new homes. Well, but that is just the easy bit. This is just the beginning, opening the door. Yet we still have that sense of importance, of this being a real line in the sands of time that we are crossing here. This is the big moment. So John passes through the ice, along with all the men who have a part to play in this. Tension is kept up by having archers up above atop the wall, and don't think that that's not noticed by everyone on the other side as well. And then we find Tormund waiting on that other side. He has come, he has kept to the deal, so far anyway, and he's also brought his own guards, so the two sides are more like each other than they would admit. Before they begin, Tormund requests John come and be presented before his people. He wants to dispel some of the mystique around both John and the Night's Watch, for stories are told to children on both sides of the wall. He wants them to see that these are just people they are dealing with, the same as them. And I love that inclusion, it's almost a little funny because we've obviously been dealing with it from one side of the wall and have seen all their stories and prejudices from the Seven Kingdoms, but for smart people like you and I, we would have always known that wildlings are people too. They have their own stories and prejudices, they've got their own things to deal with because they are normal 3D people as well, George fills them out as much as anyone else. Tormund's aim is to not make John slash the Night's Watch seem so intimidating so that he can ease the day for his people who, let's face it, are really up against it right now. This is a huge deal with plenty for them to be worried about. Or you could be cynical and think he's just trying to lower John a bit to boost up his own ego, but I go with option one. But John does not like that. That is a lesson I would sooner they never learned. He wants the wildlings to remain in awe of the Night's Watch because that will keep them in line and stop things from turning to blood. The irony is that the two leaders are really trying to achieve the same thing. John says, let's keep them all in line. That will dissuade anyone from taking liberties and starting violence. Tormund says, let's relax them a bit. That will keep them from hyping themselves up over the line and starting violence. So there's a deep irony in those two different approaches. But it's John who gets the last word as he summons Ghosty to come speeding out of the gate so fast that Tormund nearly loses his horse. So, message sent. Tormund isn't overly happy about that, but he accepts, blowing his own horn, and then we begin. From dawn till dusk, John watched the wild things pass. So here we are, a day that belongs to history. But first there is the blood price, the coming of the hostages to ensure there is a rigid agreement and threat that guides the rest of the day. Tormund tries to instill a little bit of guilt in John for asking this price, but gives the sense that really he knows the necessity of it. John thinks of just how massive a moment this is for these boys that are coming now, though he ignores that he did a semi-similar thing himself. He was only a tad older than most, but he was still travelling to what was basically another world 
to serve as the lowest of the low in this old order. Of course, he also thought he was following his uncle for cool adventure times. These boys have no such compunctions and have the much larger issue of actually crossing the wall into this new world, into going into the arms of the enemy, which really dwarfs John's own experience in the truth, but you can see the comparison. Yet he makes sure to note the bravery, the stiff upper lip, is another quote for you. The boys were going to a place that none had ever been before, to serve an order that had been the enemy of their kith and kin for thousands of years. Yet John saw no tears, had no wailing mothers. These are winter's people, he reminded himself. Tears freeze upon your cheeks where they come from. Not a single hostage bolt or tried to slink away when his turn came to enter that gloomy tunnel. That's impressive. That's very good. That attitude is probably going to be needed both sooner and later for these people. And Winter's people. I like that phrase. I wonder if that's a hint of the ending we saw in the show where John goes off with his wilding people. I wonder if Winter is supposed to be represented by John. John takes his time to analyse and watch. All these hostages are in a pretty bad way in terms of hunger, and those are the healthy ones. And he also backs up his point the one that should be obvious but unfortunately isn't, that these are a group of people like any other in terms of their variety and shape and background and size and customs. They're just humans, really. And all types are now coming together for this single moment and purpose. That kind of thing continues as Tormund gives a running commentary, almost like we're at the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, that's what this reminds me of. He points out the ones to watch, he gives information on background and history, he teaches a little something about the interpersonal relationships, as well as tips on how John might want to handle this and that as a Lord Commander trying to avoid spilt blood. Hate and rivalry and all other human aspects existed on the other side of the wall as well, and even this great union of purpose won't completely wipe that all away. We get more and more of that of the highlighting of specific names, proving how valuable someone like Tormund can be. For instance, we have the Garrett Kingsblood Raymond Redbeard mention. We'll bring that up again in a moment because that will come up in John's final chapter. But then we have this quote, which is probably more important to us on the first read. Of a certain runty rat-faced boy, Tormund said, That one's a whelp of Varamir Sixkins. You remember Varamir, Lord Crow. Well, he might as well be asking us, do we remember Varamir? I think we do. This is a bit of a blast on the past. It takes us right back to that particularly evil chapter the evil prologue yes it does turn out it was kind of a trendsetter wasn't it and firstly we just have to feel bad for this kid for having varamir as a father but we also wonder if any of the gift remains in him we wonder about varamir with bran we wonder if this is a hint of whites coming as they did for varamir it's just amazing to have him brought up again here after so long and it's even more fun just to see how the others hated him his own people which was certainly well deserved we know that Two girls try to sneak in until Tormund gets them out of it. Though he argues that girls are just as valuable as boys, both as hostages and warriors. That's a nice progressive attitude that we like to see. One that John would probably agree with in the right situation, especially if he ever meets Aya again. But it's also not his point right here as he informs Tormund about brave Danny Flint and what became of her. That's an awful story always to be reminded of, but it's also a signal from John that he's under no illusions. He's not running a castle full of angels here. It's a good reminder, again, that it is the overall mission that counts, not the individual morality. Not here, not now. And it's also a reminder that both sides are capable of such crimes, even if some brothers insist that only one side is. The final hostage, yeah, we're sealed just on that stage, is Drin, Tormund's own son, sent as a sign to both John and his people. Tormund is not exempt. He is suffering the same as everyone else. He's being a good leader. And John acknowledges that by making Drin a page, a place of honour for the deal that was struck. Whether Drin wants to be a page or not, we don't know, but both he and Tormund face the task bravely. And it's always good to slot in a reminder that John believes Bran dead by Fion's hand, as mentioned here. That belief will likely become important again at some point. I see Bran and John's stories converging, but there's also a possibility of Fion being sent to the wall, however unlikely. You have to wonder, how would John possibly react to that? He'll probably be long past worrying about such barriers if the wild John theories become true, if it even did happen, but whatever state he was in, it would be very hard for John to accept Fionn concerning his past crimes. It's probably lucky that he doesn't turn up now because John wouldn't be able to resist and the favouritism, the Lord Commander does what he wants rumours, would start up again pretty quickly. So we get another blast on the horn from Tormund and now we're on to section 2. The ones aren't hostages but people that will actually be manning the wall and maybe even saying the words. The warriors, all a thousand of them. So there is quite a few. And obviously that makes this part a bit more tense for everybody. A hundred teens and children was one thing. Now you are ushering an army through the wall. John even wonders if this was an attempt at intimidation by Tormund. But when he says such, Tormund points out that if they send the non-fighting women through first, maybe the Night's Watch decides that's enough for them and seals the gate. An essential repeat of the crime done at Hardhome, which Tormund doesn't actually know about yet. Like with earlier on, it's basically both of them trying to occupy the same idea. Tormund makes the point that this is a give-take situation. They have to be allowed their safety nets in the same way the Night's Watch is. Trust runs both ways, and there's no shame in caution. But they have to be equal. Now don't you go thinking me and mine don't trust you. We trust you just as much as you trust us. 
that gets a smile out of John, so it's officially approved. And it ties in well to the memory of Egret as well, which sometimes gets a smile out of John and sometimes doesn't. Amongst the warriors are fathers of the hostages, just as diverse as those who came before. Some of them understandably hate John for the blood price that has been paid. Some are direct about that, some wear fake smiles. Others are genuinely on his side, perhaps because they recognise his strength or what he's trying to do here, or because they see the simple need for it. Either way, it's got to be a little bit of a boost to John's ego. And again, we get the mention of Garrick's King's Blood, just setting up that storyline to come with Selyse that we'll discuss next time in John's last chapter. How big of a deal is that going to be, especially with what happens at the end of John's last chapter? We don't know, but it's good to see the setup. Yet more names pass, and maybe some will make their mark in wins as well. At least some of them have to, you would think. But for right now, they keep on streaming through. They keep on paying their price. And we get a few notes of interest here, such as a broken sword being presented as the treasures are paid in. And you have to wonder, is that the broken sword of Waymar Royce? Could be, does look like a pretty special sword with his diamonds inlaid in it. Well, we probably won't ever find out, but it's pretty cool to think of. There's also a mention of a warrior witch named Morna with a weirwood mask. I would like to know more about her, please. And there's chariots, just like in the dream. So John was seeing something of the present. And there's reindeer as well. Reindeer. Brilliant. Tormund and John drink together, as Tormund promised in the last chapter. That's a pretty big symbol of friendship here, as they watch a whole people change their lives forever. You're a good man, Tormund Giants, babe, for a wildling. Better than most might be, not so good as some. John's actually getting into the spirit of it a little bit here. Good for you. They keep on watching. They help get a stuck guard through the gate, which finally brings up the subject of the Horn of Draman. John states that Mel burned the horn. That is a fact to him, and it's pretty important as a major problem for the safety of the wall and therefore the world was ended. So while we might quite like the idea of Tormund hooting in derision over such a claim, his actual words are pretty damning. And what it does is amount to the idea that the horn Melisandre burned was a fake, one they found in a giant's grave while searching for the true horn when Mance's plan was still to bring down the wall if needs be. But because the thing really looked the part, as we can attest to, Mance had the idea to just say it with the Horn of Draman once he couldn't find the real one. The threat, maybe, would still be enough to force a piece and get his people through the wall, as we remember from the end of Storm of Swords when John went to go and treat with him. It's a discussion we've had before, so I won't repeat it too much for you, but it's come up at that burning of supposed Mance. We had that moment back in Storm, like we say, and we also had another moment in Storm back when Egret claimed that they never found the horn. So there's all these conflicting reports and John doesn't know which to choose right now. Had Mance Raider lied to him, or was Tormund lying now? If Mance's horn was just a feint, where is the true horn? He's got no clue, but let's face it, it's a pretty big deal. If the horn is real at all and still exists, it's a gigantic threat to the war against the others and obviously everyone's safety on the wall. Either it's still up above the wall and maybe the others can use horns, who knows, or it has been snuck below somehow and could easily fall into the wrong hands. Now obviously we think it to be the one that Sam is carrying, the one fatefully near to Euron now, that's not good is it? And that's mainly because it fits so well into the idea of the one not looking impressed enough to be the one with true power, this kind of fits into what George likes to get up to. Somehow John forgets his own discovery of said horn, I don't know how, buried hurriedly in an important place for the Night's Watch, which is frustrating for us. Especially when John just essentially needs it right there. It is important to bring up horns again for us readers. They're going to have a major influence on the story still to come. Next week we'll have Victorian's second chapter, which will largely focus on a different horn. Sam still has his down south. And it's just another contribution to that idea of the big time and something that could undo all John has done. There are things out there in the world that can still mess everything up. So it's just more of keeping us on the edge constantly from George here. And like I say, surprisingly, John doesn't give it any further thought, which is super weird. You'd think he would at least spend longer puzzling out exactly who is lying to him. Because we have all those different threads, don't we? Was Egret misinformed? Was she a liar? Or was she telling the truth? That's what it seems like. Was Mance a liar? And if he was, does that have implications for his mission down in Winterfell, John's wondering. Now again, we know some of the truth of that. We don't know all of it. Maybe he was down there looking for the horn as well as I We just don't know. What about Tormund? Was he lying? Or was he misinformed? It doesn't really make a difference as he clearly doesn't have it. But if some people believe it's still around, if some wild things do specifically, maybe they'll latch onto the idea of a possible vengeance of bringing down the wall finally after all they've done to the, the wild things and everything like that. Now you'd think that'd be a pretty stupid idea because they know what's on the other side of that wall, but humanity, unfortunately, is pretty stupid. And I'd love to talk more horn stuff with you. Maybe we'll get another time right now. Probably don't have space to fit it in, but we'll talk about it at some point. Like I say, Victorian has to cover that next week. The distraction from the subject of horns comes, and to be fair, it probably gets us too, as Tormund grimly announces a snow sky, which hits back to what Ed said earlier on. And it gets us back on the tension loop again, as we imagine what it would look like if others appeared right now. It does seem like everything is going just a bit too smoothly for John and for this great event. So we've got to be thinking that, haven't we? 
George adds to it by making circumstances and the general atmosphere worse. Things just get a little bit more difficult. There's a bit more argy-bargy, someone gets stabbed. So we just wonder if he's all going to build to something. And obviously John has the same thoughts as he asked Tormund, who has proved a fountain of knowledge so far today, all that he knows about the others. It's an advantage of this deal that hasn't been brought up at all yet, really. These people know more of the enemy than John or his rangers ever will. That simple fact and John is thankfully aware of it. At first Tormund says no, it's too raw, it's too dangerous. You won't even risk talking about it on this side of the wall when they can still come for you. But then he does relent and starts giving up information. Some of which we've either had hinted at us or that we've guessed, but stuff that's valuable all the same. So we learn that they don't come on sunny days. That's good, but they're always there. That's bad. And what if they have the power to take away the sunny days and turn them into a snow sky, like the one it just so happens to be above them now? What happens then? Tormund also details that they were attacked as they came south, although never in force. They were just picked off as stragglers or the outriders, the ones who were ever outside the fires. We've seen such before on the retreat of the Night's Watch, but it does make you wonder why they never came at them in force, never came at the wildlings in force, as they did on the Fist. Was there some special reason they wanted the Night's Watch off the Fist? Was it just because they were Night's Watch? Or was there some special reason they didn't attack the wildlings? Didn't seem like it, does it? And we're also told, again, that fire is important, of course, but it has its limits. Once they get their claws into the weather system, apparently it's game over. There's high emotion, again, as you'd expect, when Tormund has to revisit Torwind rising as a white. We get a real sense of what they're up against when John tries to comfort his friend. I know, said Jon Snow. Tormund turned back. You know nothing. You killed a dead man, I, I heard. Mance killed a hundred. A man can fight the dead, but when their masters come, when the white mists rise up, how do you fight a mist, crow? Shadows with teeth, air so cold it hurts to breathe like a knife in your chest. You do not know. You cannot know. Can your sword cut cold? We will see, John Fort. It's an important distinction. The armies of the dead are one thing, and probably powerful enough to topple them on their own. They are horrific. They can destroy you, but they are the lesser problem. The others are completely unknowable unstoppable and though we have been in the presence of others however rarely we still have really no idea what it's like compared to the free folk who have felt this knife sharp cold john admits that straight up because he's a smart guy but perhaps more importantly he thinks of how maybe there is a way to fight it perhaps samuel tarley was onto something and swords such as longclaw are the answer they truly need to beat these things the problem is you really only get to test such a hypothesis once, don't you, if that. Still, it's the line of thinking that John should stick to, and the final connecting of dots contributes to the build-up towards the end. We've just got that all the way through the chapter, sprinkled throughout. Still, such talk as Tormund concerned, getting across how real the threat is. He doesn't want to linger anymore. He's clearly had the same vision as us of what could happen if they turn up, so he sends Torek, his other son, to go and hurry the stragglers up. This historic moment needs to end. Tempers worsen now. Everyone is hurrying, and John truly realizes why. All of them, as one, recognize the true threat. They're all worried about what could happen if the others turn up. In one way, that's terrible that such a force could incite such a feeling. On the other hand, it would be nice to have people around that actually see what John is up against for once. But it still adds to the build up, this worry. We're really thinking something could happen here. It seems absolutely perfectly set up for the one thing that could top the big events of late from two episodes ago, and if we need any further convincing, there's this. A snowflake danced upon the air. Then another. Dance with me, Jon Snow, he thought. You'll dance with me or none. Damn. Talk about ties back to the beginning. Talk about ties back to the others. This is straight back to Waymar Royce, I'm sure you remember. Straight back to our very first sighting of an other. So it seems absolutely primed for it to happen now. George has built us to an amazing peak. And yet, no, it doesn't happen. But it really does get us there, doesn't he? It is it's brilliant, it's absolutely quality that George includes this as a note for the readers to really get our blood boiling. And the theory of Waymar being mistaken for John back in the day makes that all the more juicy. I forget where I've seen that before, but I will try and include a link if I find it. John is actually thinking back to the quote he had from Alice Karstark a few chapters ago, but for our purposes, for just linking back to Waymar and linking back to the others, wow, that is brilliant, I think, from George there. And it also raises the question... What if the others did come straight after John dies in his last chapter? They almost definitely won't because of all the storylines we've got to deal with, but just imagine if John dying goes out as some kind of signal to them and they know now is the moment. I mean, that gets into a whole rabbit hole of what they know and what they don't know and everything else, but still interesting to think of. So nothing comes, not yet anyway, but we have a new tension as Tormund's secret rearguard slash insurance appears and among them is a skin changer with a monstrous boar, one that John sensed before he was even told about it. And straight away Ghost is not happy. We don't know why, but the tension is set because we tend to believe Ghost. And what if they come to blows? We do not want to see our ghosty hurt, no thank you. We've also just seen a dragon hurt a boar, so will we see the same from a direwolf? 
Is that supposed to be some kind of symbolism for the Targaryens coming back against the Baratheons? Because even if their sigil is a stag, I say if you hear the word boar, you think Baratheon, in my opinion. But really we're just left with questions here. Why don't these two animals like each other? What does it mean for the future? There's another aspect up at the wall that we can just not figure out. There's so many of them. Now we finally reach the end, and John insists on being the last one through, which is great leadership. But not before Borok, the skin changer, warns him that the others are coming. So again, <laughs> we get a great sense of the moment, one final jab here, one final burst of tension. And why the hell does he call him brother? How does he know the others are coming? It's just weird. Again, questions, questions, questions. We have this quote. That's done then, Rory said when they were gone. No, thought Jon Snow. It's only just begun. Uh, more lines in the past, and if you really, really want to stretch that out, you could say that might link that to what Arthur Dane said back in the past. I don't remember if that's in the book or just the show, but I'm going to go and stretch it anyway. So all of it is done, and after such a day, the last person you want to talk to is Bowen Marsh. But we know the criteria for John chapters, so he comes now with his official count, which is annoying and closer to his estimate than John's, and informs us of the hostages being moved off, as well as the spearwise, which will be important to remember for the next chapter. John gives the understatement of his arc when he says that Castle Black is far different now to this morning. He mentioned before about it's generally been a quiet place that's half empty. It did have a busy period at the end of Storm and the beginning of Dance, but even this far outpaces that. The place is full, and he actually sees children playing in the snow, which is just odd to think of at Castle Black, but it also reminds him of his own siblings, his own childhood, of the Starks. He can't really focus on it too much though, as it's always back to business when he gets back to his room and Clydus appears with news from Cotter Pike, which I'll read to you at length now. At Hardhome, with six ships, wild seas, Blackbird lost with all hands, two Lysini ships driven aground on Skane, Talon taking water, very bad here, wildlings eating their own dead, dead things in the woods, Bavosi captains will only take women, children on their ships, which women call the slavers, attempt to take Stormcrow defeated, six crew dead, many wildlings. Eight ravens left, dead things in the water, sent help by land, seas wrecked by storm. Ooh, okay, that came out of left field a bit. So we had all this tension, all this sense of the moment and the build-up, and the build-up and the promise, and it turns out we just had the location wrong. The others have chosen to strike at the juicier plum of hard home, though that's not hinted at till the very end of the quote. Let's break this down again because it's all important. So Cotter has lost half of his fleet already. We've got entire ships going down with all their crew. This is a disaster, unmitigated. It's a massive loss of life, a loss that John commanded. Don't think that's not going to weigh on his soul. Indeed, it seems like chaos on all fronts. You've got the Bravosi choosing only women and children, perhaps because of their own safety concerns, but the Wildlings obviously think that's a slaving thing, they're not going to react well to it. That has led to fighting between the Night's Watch and the Wildlings they're trying to save. Cotter is not the man to make a peace, unfortunately. So it's about as bad as you can get. A disastrous rescue attempt that will only result in more people dying. And again, the John Gilt is going to come strong with that when he gets the time to think upon it. That's really a bad a situation as you can get until we hear that the others have come as well. It's John's nightmare come to life. Dead things in the woods. Oh, no, people being picked off, we can imagine that. Dead things in the water. That's even creepier because we don't know how they interact with water, do we? We've got no idea. How do their powers extend into that realm? Are the weights able to cross water? Does it all freeze up? Do we have these images in our mind of corpses just crawling up the side of ships from beneath you? Ugh, definitely creepy, definitely scary. We don't like that. And if we're to believe Tormund about them influencing the weather, does that then in turn mean they can create these storms that we've heard so much that have obviously had such a bad effect? Does that also give us reason to think that they control these extended seasons and this weird clock of Westeros? We don't know. There's so many things to think about and this is just so creepy and hits so hard that it's difficult to purify it and all into ordered thought. We could probably spend another 10 minutes just going into these quotes about dead things in the water and what that means and just thinking of it like think about that ship that's gone down which one was it it was blackbird down with all hands just imagine the feeling of all those corpses all those down sailors suddenly bubbling back up to the surface and climbing back aboard ah, yeah, absolute horror we do kind of want to see it because it sounds amazing to read but also actually horrific to experience so like i said we could keep going through those quotes it's very very tempting but instead what it instills in john is a new mission even more important than the relatively easy one just completed which we've Built up as amazingly important all the way through this chapter. But now he's got something else to do. He must go. He must save his own men. He must save the wildlings. He must save everyone. It's a nightmare over there. So John thinks 
he must do it. And that obviously gives a lot of consideration for what we're expecting Davos to find or maybe get involved with as well. We've already talked about Hardhome and the importance of what could happen in terms of the others getting their hands on that many bodies and then what attack they could make. We thought it might come here. They've gone somewhere else. So we can easily envisage that as one of the big tentpoles of the series as well. Again, I want to keep talking about it for now. I'll give you the final quote instead. Jon Snow rolled up the parchment, frowning. Night falls, he thought, and now my war begins. Ugh, man, if that isn't a rousing lie, I don't know what is. George takes something that we've always known and just bumps it up a bit. He's really just manipulating the words. So we are truly moving into new territory now, like we've said a thousand times before. Into the last act. The war is on against the others. It's huge. John has done the first bit. He saved as many people as he can. Now there's a fight to be had. And to be honest, we easily could have thought that this was the last chapter of John's arc for your first time readers. It's a hell of a place to leave, isn't it? The new setting of the mission, the new goal, we're entering this new stage. We just expect, okay, we're going to pick that up. In Winter of Winter, the name certainly fits. That'll be the new focus for John, and again, maybe Davos, maybe they get to help each other out. For now, it's just a, it's a wow moment. The war is coming, the other's coming. We think, wow, this is it. We're actually heading to the end now. We're going to probably see it. And of course, we're worried for John, we're worried for Davos, we're worried for everyone at Hardhome. Again, it just seems like an absolute nightmare, but it's damn exciting and nothing else. So, what a chapter. And a really important, tense chapter with this massive moment. And George still manages to trumpet somehow. He manages to top the tension, to get to another level, to have us thinking about what can come in the future. I'm going to leave it there because there was a lot of time talking about John. We've still got three other chapters to go. But it's a superb moment, a really big one we're not going to forget anytime soon. For now, we're going to shift it over to Marine for two chapters. The first is our now weekly check-in with Barristan Selmy as we go for Barristan 2, The Discarded Knight. So this one isn't really going to need that much of an introduction because, to be honest, it's kind of a straight-on follow from Barristan 1. George had really wanted to, he could have made a super mega chapter out of the both of them and you wouldn't really miss a beat. The focus of this chapter is the meeting that we were talking about last time, the Yunkish coming to see Hisdar. So a lot of it is going to be tension based in that way and seeing how the Yungish and Hisdar interact, what the City of Marine is going to look to get out of it. I know, believe me, I know how much I say to the word tension nowadays. Don't blame me, blame George. He's the one who puts it in there. We're also going to have another layer of, yes, tension as we wonder what Barristan has come up with since he's seen Skahaz, whether he's agreed with him or not. Is he going to do something in this chapter or is he just going to watch like he has done in the past? And of course, as always, we'll be talking more about the Oves, what Barristan can do against them, what he's allowed to do, what's best to do, what Daenerys want, all those same questions over and over again, especially towards the end of the chapter. But really, we're talking about the politics in this one. What is going to happen to the city of Marine? What is this war going to look like? What is Hisdar like as a king? And I can probably guess, but we're going to find out here today. As for the chapter's title, The Discarded Knight, well, again, that's just a follow-on from Barristan 1, isn't it? That was when he was discarded. Oh, he's been discarded guarded in a larger general view right from back with Joffrey but that whole feeling has obviously come back to him now especially as he's allowed here for this meeting he's he's just not allowed to be on the official roster if you like he's not up there with his king like he should be he's just there as a member of court just in case which is lucky for us because we need to see this meeting it's very very interesting sets up so many more threads in this ever tangling mirror and he's not like i said it gets way more complicated after daenerys leaves and finally at the end of the chapter we'll reintroduce a factor we probably haven't discussed quite enough a remainder from the daenerys era Quentin. What is he doing now? How has this affected him? We really haven't given that enough discussion as we should, so we'll get into that as well. But I'm going to start you off now with a quote. All kneel for his magnificence. His Dar Zolarak, 14th of that noble name, King of Marine, Scion of Geese, Octarch of the Old Empire, Master of the Skahazadan, Consort to Dragons, and Blood of the Harpy. Yeah, well, got through it, didn't we? You can just imagine his star loving these titles being read out. He must love it, must be squirming away in his chair. Because no one is mentioning Daenerys here. All of the spotlight is on him all of a sudden. This is very much a chapter about his star, if there ever was one. It's a continuation of everything he ever wanted, even if we find that certain difficulties have come with that promotion in this chapter. We're really going to get into that, even though we hinted at it last time. So it gets our blood going from the get-go, because like I said, we really anticipate Skahaz or Barristan doing something even now or later in the chapter. His dart and his grabbing of power was the basis of their discussion at the end of Barristan 1. Now we're focusing on him enjoying that position, so what are they going to do about it? And hearing those names read out without any mention of Daenerys is probably providing some motivation for Barristan as well, which we probably think is why he's loosening his sword right here at the beginning. That's a tension giver, isn't it? 
And quick note on Barristan being able to do that here in the in the hall, in the courtroom, if you want to call it that. It probably shows some low skill for pit fighter guards. Not really the tightest security, is it, that Barristan can just start loosening his sword in such close proximity to his star, considering where Barry's loyalties obviously lie. So we've had a change in titles, but what about the furniture? Well, Danny's ebony simple bench that we've seen her sit on like a bunch of times in this whole book, that's gone. It's been replaced by his star's thrones. Of course, he's got the thrones, he's got all the gear, he's got a scepter for himself. He's all about the show, about holding himself up. He's all flash over substance. It's so very different to Daenerys and it piles on our dislike of him. And Barristan can probably say the same thing. This is not the impression you want to give to us, the reader, or to sell me. Okay, sure, there's two thrones, there's one for Daenerys at least, so he isn't completely ignoring her existence or where he derives his power from, but still. And Barry knows the truth anyway, that this chair is no replacement for her herself, and the figure that is missing from it is the important thing. Everything else just seems thin and temporary, there's this like veneer of, again, flash over it, it's fake, it's Hollywood in a way. And much of this chapter will be about how that doesn't hold up, you need more than that, you need something real, like Daenerys, we'll get to that soon enough. Like I mentioned, both of the thrones are surrounded by the surviving pit fighters who are still on the up and up now that his die is in charge. We've got Gogor, we've got the Spotted Cat, Balakwo and Kraz specifically. The Barristan can recognise their skill in their craft down in the pit, but as guards, where danger can come from anywhere and you need constant vigilance, no, he's not sold. He says that's a very different game to what you guys do down there, where your enemy just comes when the whistle's blown. Some of that might be ego from Barry and him having to prop up the skills that are his life's work, putting them on too high a shelf for mere pit fighters. So maybe he's being slightly unfair, but he's probably right. And rereaders know we're heading towards a test of those theories anyway, especially when we're talking about Kraz. As with his first chapter, Barristan again reflects on his age. This time it's about the tiredness he feels and the difference in his sleep patterns. Everything is always a constant comparison between young and old for Barristan, which many people his age do but it's a strong vice for him to have to carry and it particularly links into that athlete analogy that we're always making we did last time we will this time i'm gonna bet we do embarrassing free as well when it was that big a part of your soul it's really hard to let go of the glory days or at least not compare yourself back to then so i think this is probably just always going to plague barry unfortunately it just comes with the territory of being that good back in the day but the paragraph also serves as a bit of character build-up as we're told about this simple man and his simple bedroom remember george only has four chapters to build this character for us in a really short arc so he has to fit in these little notes like his carrying of the warrior carving to make himself feel better that's obviously not something we would have ever got if we had didn't have barristan as a pov so that's a really nice nugget just dropped in there from george barristan is going to be important and obviously at the end of this book but probably in the next one too so he needs to have that build up this particular poor sleep is born from frustration and second guessing over what has been laid upon him in his previous chapter by Skahaz. the questions of what is right and what would daenerys want and what do his oaths allow in relation to his star specifically to say nothing of how to best defend the city let's not forget the volantines are coming he made a step forward by mere inches at the end of that chapter agreeing to interview the confectioner and talk to grey worm but we're not told here what's come of that so again the tension is up there we've got a hunch but maybe it's gone further since then but we don't know the result or whether he's been back to Skahaz, or whether they've spoken again and whether his worrying about oaths has increased but we definitely suspect so we've got different titles different thrones other than that it's the same hall but it's full of different people not only is the woman of the hour missing in daenerys but all those who supported her from the dothraki to Masande, even up to dara naharis now we might not miss him personally that much but the point is this is a really intense entire regime swap really that's occurred here it's almost like the softest luckiest coup ever everything's just fallen into place and now all of daniel's lot's been wiped away all of his dar's lot can step into their space i still maintain that this would have been his dar's eventual dream anyway assuming he wasn't trying to kill Danny, just this scrubbing away of everything that is hers and replacing it with what is his. Circumstances have just allowed that to happen a lot faster. As he's looking upon these new people, Barry singles out Marquez, Skahaz's replacement for the Brazen Beast, his star's cousin, who we meet on the page for the first time today, and who Barry basically sums up as the Mimini's version of Janos Slint, i.e. a dick. So Barry does know his stuff, we trust that analysis. But then he also adds on to the tension by only now realising that Skahaz could still be here, among the many masks that have always made Barry so uncomfortable. And that's true, and it gives us the sense, hey, maybe we're going to see a plan be put into action here, hence the loosening of the sword. But it also adds on to Barry's hated atmosphere of the underhanded and the secret, and all of that that he just doesn't want to get involved with, even after the end of last chapter. And again, that's noble, that's great that you don't want to be a part of it, but you should be aware of it, especially considering your job for the last half century and what you're up to now. The hall thrummed to the sound of a hundred low voices, echoing off the pillars and the marble floor. It made an ominous sound, angry on the faces in the crowd he saw. Anger, grief, suspicion, fear. 
So there's definitely atmosphere again here, though we're not quite sure why this great gathering is so tense. On the first page, it was all painted as everything Hisdar could want. Now we find that, like Daenerys, he's actually facing a court full of angry, grasping people that want something from him. A people divided, as Barristan details for us here. We have nobles come to complain about what happened in the pit and what is owed to them. That scales from damaged palanquins all the way up to fallen dead siblings. But the larger issue is the divide in this crowd between nobles and freedmen, a problem as real for his dart as it was for Danny. They still hate each other, as we see as this little scuffle breaks out here. They still have very different priorities, such as the freedmen and women demanding answers about Daenerys and denouncing his dart in the same breath. So it's not ideal for his dart, not by any length. Having to still announce her as alive and returning soon, he needs that. He'd rather everyone just be satisfied with him, of course, but that's not the reality. So is this supporting evidence that he was not behind the locust because he knew this would be the reaction? Or was he just not aware that things would end up like this? Or is he confident, or was he confident in the past, that he could get through it regardless? We don't know. Resnak is doing his best to placate the crowd, but it's not really working. They're still buzzing like this hornet's nest. No one is satisfied. Everyone is angry. And Barry can see how uncomfortable his dart is upon his throne. So at least we can take some solace in that. We know why, don't we? because he's not supposed to be there. While Barry listens, he also watches. He's had enough practice at that over the years. He spies amongst this crowd of his does one lone reminder of Daenerys, Quentin and his buddies down there out in the crowd. Obviously giving us some chapter sequencing because Quentin's coming up next, but also raising a point, like we mentioned in the intro, that we've not even considered amongst all this Danny drama, what the hell happens to Quentin now? How does he feel about seeing his ultimate mission, the woman he crossed the world for, fly out of the door, fly out the door? It's been a while since we had one of his POVs, but we well know what she means to him. She means the death of his friends, the sense of duty to his father, the hopes of all dawn in their quest for maybe not just vengeance, but survival. Although, note, the revenge thing never really comes up in Quentin's mind. We'll talk about that later on. And she is most definitely tied to, to Quentin's own sense of self-worth. And she's gone. His mission cannot be completed. It's literally impossible. She's either disappeared or she's dead and he's left with nothing. In fairness, now, Danny had already told him it was over prior to Drogon's coming. We don't know whether he actually took that in or not, but we can guess and we're going to have it confirmed in our next chapter. Even if he did, her flying off on Drogon is a more definite ending and takes away any chance he might have clung to about changing her mind, or even at least establishing that relationship that Dawn could take advantage of when Danny does eventually come west. So what he's feeling or planning or even doing here is a complete mystery right now, as is his remaining part of the plot for first timers. What else could he actually do here in Marine? Again, we're not going to have to wait too long to find out, but right here, we're confused. For Barry, it is another sort of tension. There's that word again, bingo. Daenerys told us and Quentin what danger he was in by being here, and Barry obviously agrees. That has only increased now she's gone, and there's absolutely nothing to stop Hisdar from acting on his dislike. So this is very dodgy ground indeed, especially when it looks like Hisdar could really use a win. So that's another question that we have to lay at Quentin's feet. For now, we have a rather important passage that we actually referenced much earlier in this project, I think in either Quentin 1 or 2, concerning Quentin's chances with Daenerys in the first place. You might remember me going on about it at some length, but I'm going to do it again, because this is where Barry is a tad unfair to both Quentin and Daenerys in his assumptions and summations, even if he does still land on the correct conclusion. I'll give you the quote. She wants fire, and Dawn sent her mud. You could make a poultice out of mud to cool a fever. You could plant seeds in mud and grow a crop to feed your children. Mud would nourish you where fire would only consume you. But fools and children and young girls would choose fire every time. Hmm, not too happy with this. Now, like I say, we covered it way back when, so I try not to repeat myself, but it's just not doing quite right by either character, Quentin or Daenerys, and it annoys me. Whether it's a case of an old man being out of touch with the younglings or whatever else, whatever excuse you want to use, it's just not on. Calling Quentin mud, first off, after he's crossed half the world, lost friends, fought in battles, duped sellsword, and thrown his soul bare in front of the world's most powerful woman doesn't sit quite right with me. I realise that he's talking more about personality than deeds, and there is some truth in there in what Daenerys saw, we read that in her own POV, but it's just not fair. It's not giving Quentin his due. And at the same time, even more annoyingly actually, he's oversimplifying Daenerys here. He's not appreciating her for the complex, fully layered person she is, and really he should know, he spends enough time with her. He is putting all of her decision on looks and excitement, and all those feelings that he likely categorises as girly, if we were to ask him. The fancies of the young. Hmm. As we've discussed, those are important to Daenerys, and that's absolutely fine, that is valid and true. His mistake comes in thinking that that was 100% of what she was concerned with. Danny's decision was based on the betterment of her people. Quentin brought a promise based half a world away. Right now, he did not have spears, he did not have dawn, he could not help Daenerys or resolve the marine situation, and he had come at too late a time, where if Danny had chosen him, the peace would have come down and everyone would have suffered. Quentin seeming pretty vanilla next to recent experiences with Dario, they played a part in the decision, sure, 
but it was a low, low percentage. The things I just mentioned, they are the real reasons. And Barry does not get that, and I say it's a disservice to his queen. I wonder if this oversimplification or underappreciation of her will eventually play a part in his expected betrayal. It would be fitting for a man whose job it is to always watch, to have seen nothing of what and who has been standing right in front of him. And just to compound those issues, Barristan even looks to Jerris Drinkwater, who has all of the charisma that Quentin doesn't, and the looks to boot, and wonders if Danny would have made a different decision. And here we have to get mightily frustrated with Barry, because no, no she absolutely would not have. Jerris Martell, if, if such a person existed, still wouldn't have brought spears, still would have only brought a promise on a piece of parchment, and he still wouldn't have helped in her current situation. Maybe she would have lingered on her thinking for 30 seconds longer, maybe. Maybe she would have wished she could have said yes on the basis of being attracted to him, but ultimately no, he wouldn't have been accepted and Barry should know that. So I'm going to have my little rant there. Braston, you are underselling both characters. You're really out of touch. You're really showing yourself to be too simple and foolish here. So pull your socks up and do a bit better, please. These people deserve more from you. Just because they're a lot younger doesn't mean they're of any less worth. Either way, while watching the Dornish Free, Barry notes that his dart is frowning at them, as though he's only just remembered their existence, and then he's whispering in Margaz's ear, and Barry gets a sense of what that might mean. So at least his eyes are still sharp enough to catch those details. But now it comes back to inner arguments, and as always with this guy, oaths. And it can be almost frustrating to read how much he governs every thought, let alone his actions, based on those oaths and their laws. You can easily see how it would give way to a philosophy that we might see via Jamie, or Sandor again perhaps. It's just too restricting. Barry is obsessed. He's addicted to these oaths. In this case, at first, it's a reminder that he is not beholden to Dawn in any way. He doesn't owe Quentin anything, which is true, but it's not the kindest way of thinking. Luckily, he then remembers Lewin Martell, his old brother, and that he has an opportunity to honour that old teammate by helping his nephew, because the danger is so very real. But Barry is so submerged in the plotting and the planning game now that paranoia catches up with him when he has the idea that maybe Quentin has earned that danger by being the one to poison the locusts in the hope that his diet would be the one to eat them and die and therefore that would open up the roster spot for him again. He is from Dawn after all, we know the rumours about Oberyn and poison, so the prejudice certainly fits. I think what this signifies is Barry just being overwhelmed by his current situation with Scarhands and all the shady stuff. He's not used to it and now he's seeing a plot in every shadow. And it's true, this isn't a possibility that we've mentioned before for the first timers, but I'd be pretty surprised if anyone believed this chance when Barry brings it up. It seems like a pretty awful plan anyway if Quentin were to do it, considering how likely it was that Daenerys would also eat the locust and then also die. So unless you're saying this is just an out and out revenge plot for Quentin, it doesn't guarantee any success and it doesn't really link up with the Quentin we know so far. Obviously rereaders know that's not true, but I don't think many first timers are going for that anyway. Luckily, Barristan gets distracted from such an idea. Although note the word wrestling is used here, his not knowing and his being in such foreign waters, that's all really having an effect on him. I think that's an important word. Because we discover what this audience is actually all about or a reminded rather because we were told last time and why George is bothering to use it as a POV as a chapter this is a parlay yes his dad has already held audience but that was just the precursor now we've got the main event the Yunkish have come to discuss this new post Daenerys world that they find themselves in the peace must be adjusted we already know that from the last chapter like I said but we know they are pissed about what happened in the pit they're apparently just biding time for war with Volantis coming to help them even though that's supposed to be secret for people here and therefore this is a major, major point in the plot of Marine, and we can see why his dart is so tense. He had things sitting pretty beforehand, whatever his overall plans for Daenerys were. Now with blood having been spilt, and the inclusion of Volantis, he's facing being cut out of their deal, cast aside and cast down, either by these people or by his own peers, so this meeting needs to go well. Those who were friends and likely conspirators beforehand could very easily be enemies now. That's just the name of the game. And with them, with the Yunkish, comes Bloodbeard, not to mention their other armed guards. So a message is sent right at the beginning here that this is not going to be a friendly call. And Barry notes that Bloodbeard is here, but not Brown Ben or the Tattered Prince. So we have to wonder if that's because they are already considering their switching of sides. Is that what effect Tyrion is already having on the Second Sons, like we saw in his chapter last week? Did Danny's final plan with Pretty Maris have an effect, maybe? We'll get some answers in our next chapter of Quentin but for now it seems as though Bloodbeard and his company of the cat are the only ones fully invested in the Yunkish side or they've at least been given pride of place and as we've mentioned a few times Bloodbeard is fully striding into the narrative now step by step and we can expect that to continue come wins he's really just becoming more important as he goes for now Barry considers dancing with him and is confident of his abilities we're going to see that of Kraz instead in this book but maybe this is another jewel we'll get to see at some point here's his quote give me half a reason to dance with you and we will see who is laughing at the end
Oh, there's so much talk of dancing and duelling in today's chapters. Now, the mere inclusion of Bloodbeard in peace talks might give away that your stance is probably not going to be friendly and will probably just be quite aggressive instead because we know this guy's stance on things. And it turns out we are exactly right because as soon as Reznak moves forward and starts with his polite nib begging welcomes, Bloodbeard interrupts by throwing a severed head right at Reznak. As diplomatic acts go, throwing a severed head at someone is fairly clear. Walking into a city, into a throne room, and doing it in front of the supposed king and all his court is even clearer. Hence why the pit fighters move in front of Hizdar now, and the atmosphere changes to one of clear, sharp tension where anything could happen. So our theories about the Yunkish not being here to kiss and make up are pretty much confirmed. But before we actually get to all that and what it means, we have this head to deal with. Reznak, fresh off of screaming and getting the hell out of the way, identifies the head for us. Gingerly, so gingerly, the Seneschal approached the head, lifted it delicately by the hair. Admiral Grolio. Ah, boo. That sucks, isn't it? Obviously, rereaders have known this annoying little moment has been coming, and we've discussed it before in this book when Grolio was highlighted, but it still sucks because he was a pretty decent guy. As we mentioned at that time, he was basically just a neutral who got caught up in this grand gravitational well that is Daenerys Targaryen. He was supposed to be a delivery driver, originally, take Barry and Belwas to Danny, then pick Danny up and take her back to Pentos and Eero. That's what he signed up for. And in fairness, when things took a turn and it didn't go that way, and Danny began her own conquest instead, he bought into it. He served her. He gave up his ships and he gave his advice and anything else. Certainly, we have to make it clear, she wouldn't have got where she did without him. Now, he grumbled along the way here and there. Certainly, as more of himself and his wares got used up in the name of said conquest, yet he still served and he didn't complain overly. A captain losing his ships is always so very hard to bear, especially in the style that he lost them. But he did it still, he got on with the job. And then we had that earlier interaction in Dance with him where he did speak up against his queen, where he did want to finally go home and see his family and leave war behind because none of his opinions or wants were being listened to. And he didn't get that opportunity. He was instead offered up as a hostage. And now it's paid the ultimate price, all for just being associated with Daenerys, really. He had done no crime, he had only done what was asked. So it's a really sad moment. He won't get to see his family, he won't get to sail a ship ever again. He even had to die as a prisoner in the hands of these fools. So, nasty. And a big, if undersold part of Danny's legacy is gone. It is too harsh a view to say that he was just used up and spit out by Daenerys, we know that's not the truth, but you can push the camera to focus that way if you are really that inclined. I'm still wondering what Danny's reaction will be when she finally comes to learn about this, especially given that final interaction, and you've got to think it's really going to hurt her down on a personal level, and maybe some extra yunkai will burn for it. So it's goodbye Grolio from us, unfortunately, you will be missed. And if we take the thinking out from him specifically, then the immediate thought on top of this is, obviously, A... Well, that peace shore seems in the rearview mirror. But B, what does this mean for the other hostages? At best, they are in extreme peril, aren't they? At worst, Grolio is just the first. Maybe they're all going to end up like this. We know not about Dario or Hero or Jogo or his Dar's relations. We can assume that at least not all of them are dead because then the Yunkish would have no bargaining slash threatening position. And we likely especially extend that to his Dar's family as well because those are the ones who would motivate him the most. But Hero, Jogo, Dario, well, they really are in a bind now if the Yunkish are willing to do this. And it's a question that's actually going to stick with us through to wins. We don't know about their fate or what's going to happen to them. But let's get back to the actual chapter where Barry's first reaction to poor Grolio is to look at supposed King Hisdar. And in order to analyse him, he refers back to the three kings of his career, Jaehaerys, Aerys and Robert. The three of them surely saw a lot of severed heads, Aerys probably collected them, but having one thrown at your feet in your own court is an entirely different matter. And Barry reckons the three kings would have essentially had the same reaction, just meted out differently. Jaehaerys would arrest his opposition instantly, Aerys would order their deaths on the spot, whereas Robert would try and do the killing himself. And for all we know of these three men, we can agree that Barry is on the money. Which is what highlights his die here, because he does nothing. He is a deer in headlights, clearly frightened, overwhelmed by the moment and the pressure, and trying to think of how to save himself. He's weighing up his options again. He's supposed to be angry and defensive, like the kings that Barry mentioned, but that would mean angering the Yunkish, the ones who put him in this position in the first place, and might take it away again for an act of war. For all of this billboard talk, his new throne, his scepter, with all the glitz and glamour, Hisdar is not a king, as if we were in any doubt. He is not worthy to sit in Danny's place. And speaking of Barry, why are you only thinking of the kings? What about the queen you've served? Why are you not wondering how she would react? That's another weakness of his, and I do wonder if this is just going to build of Barry just not valuing Danny as much as he should be because of her gender. That might actually be an issue come the next book. We're going to have to return to it. Now, we can't say of a certainty whether Danny would lean closer to the reaction of her father or her grandfather, but probably her father, seeing as it's Grolio. But either way, she would do something more than this, more than his dar. Once he's got that out of the way and the rest of the court senses the change in the air at this affront to civilised discussion, Barry now focuses on the personal. We've been thinking about Danny's relationship with Grolio, 
But we forgot about Barristan. He also spent a lot of time with the Admiral. The man literally brought Barristan to this new life and his new calling and this big change in his world. He thinks this. Grolier was a good man. He did not deserve this end. All he ever wanted was to go home. So that really is the tragedy of Admiral Grolier there. And I think that's an important story to remember in this grand saga, this grand tale of Daenerys Targaryen. To Barry, he doesn't like it. He can want to react as well. He's not happy both with the details or the fact that this is being done at all. But as always, it's not his place to react. So he keeps quiet for now. Instead, his stuff finally finds his voice only to hardly use it. He's stammering. He's unsure. And he gets bulled over by the Junker slavers who announced their message of why Grelu had to die. The basic line of thinking is that this is repayment. They said that Marine drew first blood, not them, that seven Junkish entered the city under a hospitality agreement that they would remain safe. And we know that part. We saw them being wined and dined by Hisdar during Danny 8. But their safety was not ensured. For Yurkazo Yunzak, the Supreme Commander, was killed in the, in the chaos of people trying to get out of the pit. We know that already. Of course, we also know that was no fault of Marine, as Barristan will point out himself in a minute. It was mere chance. We hardly knew a dragon would come and people would run away. It's not our fault. You might as well punish this if he had died by choking on his food. It's the same circumstances. But the Junkish, they have their lawyers out. No, 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 they say. Circumstances are irrelevant. We had a contract. It said no one would come to harm in your city, and they did. It's right there in black and white. So by all the rules of warfare, we are now allowed to pay you back in kind by killing one of yours. That's how hostages work, they say. So the Junkish, unsurprisingly, are most definitely being underhanded and sneaky, taking advantage of the situation to falsify their way into provoking Marine and are just acting in bad faith. It sucks, it's rotten, and it's entirely in keeping with the way they do business, as we've seen over and over again. Morality or honour just don't enter into it. Morality and honour just don't enter into it. And poor Grolio had to lose his life because of such slimy tactics. Barristan actually gives further focus to the fallen admiral now. Why was he the one killed when he seems to have held the least value? Danny, not having any ships after all. Or is that the point? Start of the lowest to ensure the blowback isn't too bad and you don't overstep your mark. Or start of the lowest so you'll still have people of higher worth to threaten with. Barry's mind does not work so well in such rabbit warrens, so he speaks his mind now instead, defending the fact that Yurkaz died by coincidence, whereas Grolio definitely did not. And if you want to be really technical, then it was Yunkish people that killed Yurkaz more than Miranese in that stampede, so this payback is obviously not equal in any way. The Yunkish, knowing that Barristan is absolutely right, decide to ignore the question entirely and instead attack proper protocol, claiming that it is not good manners for Barristan to be talking to them in the first place, that this is beneath them and is a sign of disrespect, you know, as if they haven't just thrown a head on the floor. His diet is apparently still too mesmerised with the head to be active in the conversation. Is that just because he's not used to seeing death so close up, or because this wasn't part of the deal? We'll come back to that idea in a moment, I think. It takes a push from Reznak to get the king talking at all, when he asks who has replaced Jokaz as supreme commander, and is told that they all have, as the Council of Masters. So this is what we spoke of and had a great big laugh at back in Quentin 2, the moment when all the Yunkish lords decide that they are equally in charge. That in itself isn't a bad idea, it's later on when war is confirmed and they figure the best way to organise themselves is to build a leader rotor where they all get a turn each day. And this idea is still hilarious to me. The absolute obvious stupidity of it, as if anyone anywhere could ever believe that this would work for anything, let alone a large battle or a siege. We'll see this best in Tyrion's chapters, and especially once we get into the wins previews, but I just can't let it pass because of all the examples of stupidity, or being a moron that we might have in these books, I do think this probably tops them all. It is amazing. Still, like I said, the evidence will come later and we'll have to enjoy it then. Hisdar surprises us all when he actually does stand up a little bit and calls this head throwing what it is, a breach of the peace. But the youngish lawyers, again, point to the contract. No, that's what hostages are. One of ours died, so now one of yours has. We're all fair and square. And just to smooth over the fact that we're really stretching the lines of etiquette and fair play, we'll all give you three of your hostages back as a sign of good faith. So they do know they've done wrong, really. They're just not going to admit it. And wouldn't you know it, those three hostages they're giving back just so happen to be those of his Hisdar's family, his sisters and cousins. And while Barry doesn't think on it here, we readers have to put our suspicion hats on. Isn't that convenient that it was his Hisdar's family specifically who were returned? Is this a hint that they are still dealing together under the table as they did before? And this is all just a public saving of face? That definitely checks out. And you could even conclude that Hisdar had agreed to that, but not to the killing of Grolio, hence his reaction. He's done this before with the Junkish, so why not again? Try and buy himself a place of safety and then get out of the way should it come to war. That makes sense. We can only guess at how true that is or how far any such deal might go because we have no real evidence just yet. But it's the kind of thing that tends to go on here, isn't it? Some version could easily be true, even if the particulars are changed. We'll address that question more in the next Barristan chapter when Skahaz returns. For now, Barry is not thinking of plots, he's thinking of honour, as he tends to do when he applies to have Grolier's body returned so that he can be buried at sea, 
a request that's accepted, so that's something. And it's another mark in Barrison's column, seeing as he's the only one who seemingly cares about the dead admiral. Resnack now, again seeming a little too scripted for my liking, brings up the three remaining hostages, the ones who are the best fighters and the ones that Danny would value the most, so we can see why they've been kept, and that cues in the Yunkish publicly declaring what they want. The others shall remain our guests, announced the Yunkish lord in the breastplate, until the dragons have been destroyed. First comes the hush, because the mere idea is too surprising to even process. Then come the mutterings and whispers. Remember, this is a mixed hall. Half of them probably think this would be an excellent idea, freeing them from such fiery threats. But the freedmen know the dragons are a huge part of what freed them in the first place. On top of that, they know what they mean to Daenerys. If they love her, they love them. And this mere suggestion is the greatest insult. But that's just them. What about us? As readers, we generally tend to love the dragons, dangerous as they are. We already feel bad about them being locked up for the majority of the book, and how unfair that is, but now the suggestion of them being killed by these slimy yunkish... No, we hate that idea, yet we're probably worrying a bit about how likely it could be. It just fits a little too nicely that Danny should have this major moment of progress with Drogon, only to lose the other two. We can imagine George plotting such, because he's evil, isn't he? So then our minds start wandering off into such ideas, of well, maybe this will be the end of this marine arc in dance. Either us having to see one or two dragons meet their end, I mean, look at the name of the book again, or perhaps we'll see the saving of two dragons, and considering whose POV we're in right now, maybe we even think we're going to see an inversion of the knight going to slay the dragon being swapped with the knight going to save the dragon. Maybe that would be his grand gesture to Daenerys and his makeup to the Targaryens, even with this plot he's currently got going with Skaz. Again, Hisdar seems nonplussed. He's at least playing the part of someone surprised by such a demand. And again, whether that's true or not, we don't know. He did want Drogon dead at the time, but maybe he's been hoping the other two can be tamed. Or maybe he's just thinking that these are his last collateral for keeping Yonkai at bay, his last threat. Resnak tries to claim that only Daenerys can command such a thing, and duh, she never would, but Bloodbeard interrupts again by insisting that she's dead. Bloodbeard's scorn cut him off. She is gone, burned and devoured. Weeds grow through a broken skull. A roar greeted those words. Some began to shout and curse. Others stamped their feet and whistled their approval. So that is just too close to the bone. It's too disrespectful, and the reaction from the hall, or half the hall at least, is expected. We actually like to see that Danny has such love even in her absence, although that's obviously countered by the other half quite liking the idea. So, not good. Marine is still very much mixed up. All the way through, Barristan does what he does best and watches. He watches Bloodbeard and realises that he is the real issue here. He's the bloodthirsty one that will do whatever is needed to break the peace and sow chaos. And we can guess he's going to be a major problem come wins because he's just out there to watch the world burn, so to speak. For now, the discussion is closed as Hisdar says he needs to think it over. So we're left wondering on his secret deals or opinions about this as the brazen beasts force the others out. And Barry actually gives the dragons no more thought either, even if we are, as he instead moves over to Quentin and Chums. It obviously being critical that they've heard of all of this for their future storylines. So Barristan watched them, thoughtful. What would Daenerys want, he asked himself. He thought he knew. So apparently it is decision time for Barry and he's chosen a path. And it's to try and save Quentin as he advises the three of them to leave the pyramid and Marine right now, straight away, for all the danger they are in. Sheer surprise is their reaction, so much so that Jairus is even thinking about their arms and armour and coin. Remember, they've already had to leave a bunch of that behind in Volantis once, but Barry puts it straight. You can save those, or you can save your lives, but perhaps not both, as he informs Quentin of what he saw in terms of his dad looking at Quentin and frowning. Let's already pause here and give note of this being a big deal for Barry. He spent years watching, but acting on what he sees is entirely new ground, really. So at least he's finally making up for some of his mistakes of the past, or beginning to at least. We like to see that, that's the kind of progression we're fond of. Quentin and the others do not think that his dar should be considered a threat. Some of that is their youth, some of it is the evidence just provided by what they saw in court. Quentin is at least a bit more considerate, but does agree with Jairus. Then again, he also admits that Danny did warn him about his dar. And that bothers Barry. If Danny warned you, why have you not heeded her and gone? And Quentin is a little embarrassed to explain, perhaps because he knows how foolish it is, as he reveals that Danny did not get through to him about the dragons. He is still clinging on to the idea of the marriage pact. So it falls to Barry to really lay it out flat for Quentin, much more directly than Danny did, to be honest. Listen, man, he says, it ain't happening. You've been given a leaky boat to sail here on. It's not your fault, you didn't build it, but that doesn't make it any sturdier. The promise was made by two men who were gone. That's a shame, but it's reality. And it was never about you or Danny in the first place. You fit in, fine, but that doesn't really help, does it? Duran's secrets are super secure, maybe too secure, Barristan suggests here. And you could have a long, deep discussion about how true that is, and if you do want to, I recommend you go and have a look at the recent Radio Westroff live streams because they've been talking about such. But for our purposes, the fact is Danny never even knew. And again, it isn't Quentin's fault. Barristan isn't trying to be mean here. Actually, it's the complete opposite, even if it doesn't feel like such. This is just the reality. You came too late 
and Danny has a husband plus Dario, and unfortunately, Barristan puts in a bit of a dagger here about her liking both of them more than Quentin. Which is probably a bit of a step too far, you didn't need to be that mean Barristan, but, but it is also true. So you can see why that touches a nerve of Quentin. Maybe the rest makes sense, but this is a young guy, we know he already thinks on how much this relates to his own worth and ego, so he flashes back that they are not worthy of Danny, Dario and his dog obviously. And we tend to agree, but it doesn't rob Barry of his point. And Barry pauses, but he decides to go for it if he is going to save three young lives, and three knights don't forget, so he's extra inclined. He tells them of the locusts, and therefore plays into these plots just a little bit more, a little bit further he goes outside of his normal boundaries. And he's doing this to evaluate whether they had any part in it like he wondered earlier. But he also introduces a new idea, that Quentin, whatever he got up to, is going to make a really good scapegoat for people looking for a confectioner. And it's actually pretty damn smart for Barristan to see that. He is learning on the job here. Quentin's reaction is at least enough to convince Barry that he had no part in it, and probably us too, and we have no way of actually knowing that yet, but like we said earlier, we are all very, very doubtful that Quentin would have anything to do with it. Still, Barristan expands on why that framing would fit, it would work with Quentin, and we also get that little note about Prince Lewin and his paramour, which I always find interesting. But the point is, Quentin had both motivation and the background, his Dornish background, to paint him as using the weapon, using the locust. Jairus points out that Dario would want his star dead as well, but Barry uses his smarts again. He knows the men he watches, and he's kept an eye on Dario, you can be sure. He knows that is not his style, we've seen said style on full display. If he'd wanted to kill his dar, he would have walked up to the guy and killed him. Besides, we aren't talking about who poisoned the locusts, we're talking about who can be framed for poisoning the locusts. Yes, Dario does fit, but there's more reason to not do that, just in case his dar needs the storm crows, or if Danny comes back and is pissed her consort is gone. The much safer choice for his dar, the one that would still bring him a lot of benefits, is to paint Quentin as the poisoner. Barry thinks this. He had said all that he could safely say. In a few more days, if the gods smiled on them, his Dar Zolarak would no longer rule Marine. Well, hello, that's come out of left field, that's very interesting. Really gets us wondering what's next, and what's progressed in the plots between he and Skahaz between these two chapters. Unfortunately, we're not going to find out anymore just yet, which is annoying. The final point is him trying to keep these three safe, which he tells them is what he's doing before he finally walks off. Just take my advice and leave, he says. But Quentin, frustrated and hurt, finds confidence from somewhere as he calls out Barristan by his old nickname, Barristan the Bold. And as you'd expect, that takes Barry all the way back into the past, to his days of glory that seemed so long ago, to when he first got that name. It's the furthest into his history we've delved, as we're reminded that Barristan has basically had this name his entire life, right from the age of 10. It's who he is, which is a question he's posed to himself over and over in his last two chapters. He takes us back to a whole different era of the Stormlands with this memory, with a different Lord Dundarian back at Blackhaven. For many who read this when it first came out, or after to be fair, they wouldn't have covered the recent ages of Westeros via Duncan Egg or the World Book. So the idea of the family of Beck Dondarian, and many others as well, past generations and that just all being there in the histories, is a new, refreshing idea that you wouldn't have thought of necessarily. And bold certainly is the word, as Barry recounts his story, his borrowing of horse and plate, and how he made himself a hero of the stories by entering as a mystery knight. How the Prince of Dragonflies then took pity on him and helped cement a legend. And why focus on such a thing right now? Because it is stories like these, spread around similar young boys all over Westeros, that settle in the mind of Quentin Martell. He thinks he's the hero still. He knows the bold ones get remembered, the other ones get mocked. That's why George is bringing this up, that's why we're having Barristan now and then Quentin after, and it's why he says this, Quentin says this. What name do you think they will give me? Should I return to Dawn without Daenerys? Prince Quentin asked. Quentin the Cautious? Quentin the Craven? Quentin the Quail? I actually think Quentin the Quail is a cool nickname, but I get his point. So, just from that, we see, no, Danny's warnings definitely did not take root. He did not get her advice. Or, neither did Barry's either. Quentin is still obsessed with not giving up, with what that would mean for him as a man, or a prince, or a son. He simply cannot compute the idea of failing, not after all that has been sacrificed. Pride plays a role too, and ego, and all those foolish things we can expect to be present in a young man, but we also know that that is complete foolishness. We want Daenerys back as much as anyone, but she's not here. And even when she was, he wasn't wanted. So he can either stay here and risk his and his friends' lives, or go back and try to make them worth something. But for greater arguments, including some great ones put forward by Jerris on philosophy, we should probably wait until the next chapter. We end with Barry's reply. Quentin the Wise, he suggested, and hopes that it was true. It's good, strong advice, and Barristan is a good man for suggesting it. Unfortunately, rereaders know that it doesn't work, and first-timers only have to wait to turn the page. And that's pretty much it for Barristan 2, to be honest. I don't think there's an overly amount we need to go over there. The point of the plot is pretty specific and straightforward. As we see Yonkai clash with Marine again, we're moving further and further along to war. 
There's a whole mess of possibilities and plots and under threads that could be there. They might not be there. We don't know. We're still wondering about what Scar has and Barristan are up to. So we're waiting for the next chapter for that. And really it's just a reaffirmation of what we saw in his first chapter about the O's being restricting, about Barry having to make a choice, Barry having to get used to this underhanded method. And actually, to be fair, going for it, he does decide to take action with Quentin. So that is a big step for him. We also covered some of the lesser qualities of Braniston, where he is out of touch, where he does think the wrong thing. And there's more of those to come as well. But in general, it's a right step forward. It's a build up for Marine. It's a build up for Barry. And I like it. That's a good chapter. I think it's a great building of tension. There's that word again. And I, for one, am fully invested in this Barristan arc, this quick, frequent, intense Barristan arc. So I'm really, really liking George's decision to include Barry here. I really like how this arc is turning and I really do find Marine just more interesting. I'm really built into this so hopefully you are as well. Either way we're actually going to get a pretty much straight follow on just to add more confusion, more tendrils into the Marine arc because yes we did get it mentioned in that chapter. There is danger for the dragons. We're definitely worried about that even if Barristan isn't really as much as he should be. And we're going to build towards that now as we move on but we don't go anywhere. We stay in Marine and we move finally to Quentin Free, the spurned suitor. So here we are, we're back with Quentin after our super, super long wait for what is actually the shortest chapter in the entire book, which is probably another thing you don't really expect to find at such a late stage, but here we are. Yeah, we've waited all this time and then George writes us the short one. Now let's talk about this big gap, because it, it really is a long one. We've seen Quentin pop up lately, to be fair. He's been riding the coattails of first Daenerys and now Barristan, as we've just seen. But this is his first actual Quentin POV we've had since chapter 25 of Dance, way back in The Windblown. And for reference, just so you remember where that was, that was next to when Tyrion first got taken by Jorah, when John Connington first turned up, so it is quite a while ago in terms of the narrative. And if we want to be specific, that's a 35 chapter gap between his POVs. As we discussed at the time, only John Connington can top that, I think. So sure, it's weird to be back in his POV, but he's also doing something very, very rarely done in dance, an immediate follow-up. They've always been fairly rare due to the nature of the POVs, but we have seen it at Winterfell before, right at the back of the beginning, and at King's Landing, kind of in the middle of the series. Not so much lately in Feast and Dance because everyone's so spread out. In fact, this is the only time it happens in the entire book so far that we get a POV following on from a POV in the same place, if you get me. Well, actually, that's not true. This happens once more in seven chapters' time, and it's Barristan and Quentin doing it again, back to back. So that's a little bit of an oddity there. And those two chapters, actually, the later two, are a bit more separate than these ones. This one is, really is a direct follow-on. So very, very rare in the series. Obviously, this is a Quentin much changed since we were last with him. The last time, he was fresh out of Astapor, still planning on how to get to Marine, let alone what would happen when he actually got there. Since then, they pulled off their ploy with the Windblown, he revealed himself to Daenerys and got denied, but he still stuck with the plan and met some dragons, and now Daenerys has disappeared entirely. So he's been left flailing, and he's now left in danger as we just covered. The plan is in tatters with no obvious solution, hence why we need a chapter with him, where we obviously figure this is where we'll find Quentin's next steps, as well as really getting into how he feels about everything that's gone down, even though we have got certain hints of late when people have talked to him. At the beginning of this chapter, in terms of our expectations, we might think this will be the truth of Barrison's warnings coming out, and Quentin might be in danger from his dar from some other source. It might be about his choosing those next steps instead, whether they be back towards dawn or sticking in the mud here. And if it is the latter, then how he's going to rationalise that. We're sure it'll mix in with Quentin stewing on his perceived failure, like I said, or how he can possibly make this trip worth it given all that he's lost. And rereaders confirm that we'll get plenty of arguments on that specific theme that was so strong back in his first two chapters. Let's head into it now, because yes, it is the shortest chapter of the book, but there's still plenty to cover. And we begin in the Hour of the Ghosts, which seems fitting given what Quentin is soon going to become in his next chapter. We also begin with the hint of a new plan, even if we don't know what it is yet. Jerris has returned from making contact with some members of the Windblown, if your memory can run that far back, because they give the names here, they don't actually say it's the Windblown, but we do know it's them. Jerris was set out both because Quentin is far too valuable to risk in their minds, and also Archibald isn't the best suited to the art of the deal, whereas Jerris is. And he was successful in finding them, even if it sours the stomach to find that slaves are being made to fight each other for entertainment. Obviously, this has been going on for centuries is just a part of this world but we don't like to hear about it because it's awful maybe it was even still happening in the dark corners when Daenerys was still here but now that she's gone we know this kind of thing is just going to spread in her absence so that's awful to think about and again we might have to cast our minds back to remember that Quentin and crew not only tricked the windblown but kind of made fools of them using them to get into the city and therefore to Daenerys and they are still considered deserters whether they truly believe themselves part of the company or not 
Does it really matter what they think? Matters what the Windblown thinks. And that's going to be really important throughout the chapter because desertion, that's kind of a, a key sticking point with cell swords. But then again, so is gold, which at least smoothed over the cracks enough for Jairus's mission here at the beginning to send a message to the Tattered Prince that Quentin wants to talk. And we're not actually told as much just yet, but we likely make that leap pretty quickly. We can make that connection. Instead, we have the immediate follow-up from the last chapter because while Jairus is loyal and obeys his prince, he is also a friend and he tells his friend now he thinks this is a bad idea. A meeting probably means even more danger than they're already in and he cites the advice given to them just a moment ago by Barristan Salmi. And it sounds like it was clever advice anyway, but the fact it was delivered by Barristan especially makes it worth all the more to Jairus. Because these boys, they love their heroes and their legends, and such don't come much bigger than Barristan Salmi. He is a walking wonder of the world, so when he speaks, you listen. It's actually kind of ironic that Jairus is thinking of him in that way, because later on they're going to kind of rub each other the wrong way, and we already know Barristan's not that fond of Jairus. Still, Jairus wants a ship to escape while the ports are still open, because remember, that's a fairly new thing, the ports have been closed for ages, and who knows how long it'll stay that way, especially once Valantis arrives. Archibald, he doesn't want the ships because we know how they affect him, and Quentin wants to not leave at all. Then Lise, then home, back the way I came, empty-handed, three brave men, dead, for what? So it's the same argument that it was before for Quentin. He believes that if he doesn't come home with the prize, he effectively killed his friends for no reason, and that just doesn't sit right with him. We know that, we've discussed that at length. Still, this time he does allow that it would be nice to go home, that he misses the place, and that he truly does love it. We've already established in previous chapters that Barristan hates it here, but it turns out Quentin is just the same, as are the other two, as are ev almost everyone in Marine, because Marine sucks, everyone hates it. Barristan wants Westeros, Quentin wants Dawn, when you get right down to it. And obviously George is bringing this up now to embiggen and highlight the tragic element based on the timing. Quentin wants to go home, at the same time he makes the decision that will never allow that. Besides, there is a sting that goes along with the sweet idea of returning to Dawn. Disappointing his father would be the biggie, of course, that's the main bit, but he also worries about being teased and emasculated by his sisters and cousins, and let's face it, he's right, that probably would happen. We know what the Sand Snakes are like, they're not going to let him off easy. Or, that would at least be the case if they were still there. Unbeknownst to him, of course, if he were to return to Sunspear, all four women of his generation would be gone, off on their own missions. The Sand Snakes have already been sent, Ariane is going to follow off to the Stormlands soon enough. But perhaps that would actually make it all the worse. You know that I figure the missions of the Sand Snakes are all but guaranteed to be failures in Duran's eyes, but Ariane's is likely going to seem a real success, at first anyway. All of them might look like a success at first. So if Quentin is the only one to be back there, the only one to have failed, that would make him feel even more alone, that would accentuate that failure even more. Which would suck, of course, it would be awful. But then, at least he'd be there. At least he'd be alive and back with his father. Given the option between that and what actually happens, I know which Duran would choose. And just as a side note here, it's also interesting how much focus he gives Lord Ironwood, his apparent second father is what he calls him. That's probably because of how guilty he would feel telling him about his son's death, which he thinks is obviously going to happen in the future. Now it turns out that weight is actually going to be shifted to Jerris and Archibald instead, with Duran in place of Lord Ironwood. And it's that pair of friends he thinks of now, when he tells them that they can leave, but to them it's not even a question, of course. They go where he goes, even now, even at this juncture. And it's foolish, it's stupid, but you love to see it, don't you? You love to see that loyalty and this pure friendship. Now we zip forward to the next night, where their invite is accepted, and they are told where to go and when. In return, they set the terms that both Jerris and Archibald will accompany Quentin, and they expect the Tatter Prince to mirror them in terms of numbers. That's the terms they set. Now we can guess whether that's going to be obeyed or not, we'll find out soon enough, because we zip forward again to one more night after that, when the three of them depart the pyramid and head out into the city, out for this plan that we still don't know about just yet. But we don't have to know the details to be aware of the danger, as Jerris warns again here. Now if you really want to cast your minds back to long, long ago, back to Quentin's opening chapters, you'll remember that I spoke about why I liked Jerris so much, and much of that reasoning comes from this chapter, as I believe we visited at the time. I think we really skipped forward to these specific scenes, to why Jerris is so cool, and why the loyalty is so brilliant, and his specific advice, his philosophy, that he argues about Quentin with here. His original warning is just trying to get Quentin to realise what they were actually walking into. I know you're distracted with Danny and dragons and the mission, but let's not forget what's actually happened between your two chapters. He says this. We lied to them, Quint, used them to get us here, then went over to the Stormcrows. So again, they betrayed sellswords, and sellswords do not take kindly to such. This is the real world. There's no parchment or title or queen that will protect them now. And Jairus is worried that Quentin just doesn't get that, especially when Quentin's defence is that technically they were just following orders. You'll remember that from his second chapter, that the Tattered Prince actually did command them to go over to Danny's side. But that was just sheer luck and coincidence. And now Archibald is getting involved. 
arguing against Quentin, pointing out that that kind of technicality isn't going to fly with these guys. These aren't the official courts they were just stood in, or even that they grew up in. These guys are the real deal down on the streets. If they feel hard done by, they'll get stabby real quick. And Archibald also adds the really good point that some of the windblown are still down in the dungeon specifically because of their actions. So this situation really could not be more dangerous and they both figure that Quentin is acting a fool right here and now, which he is. Quentin's next defence is that no matter the situation, a sellsword will follow gold. Now that's likely true, but they don't have much of that either. Besides, Jairus widens the danger to the city in general. Let's just forget about the sellswords for a minute. He recognises the way the wind is blowing. And even if you ignore that army outside as well, with another on its way, don't forget, the people within the city are about to turn on each other, with half being pro-dragon and the other being anti. As he explores here, by the three of them talking about the hero that dared to challenge Drogon, You'll remember, the one who got ripped apart and killed pretty much instantly. Archibald, who doesn't even remember the guy's name, he says this. He was no dragon slayer. All he did was get his ass roasted black and crispy. He was brave. Would I have the courage to face that monster with nothing but a spear, Quentin thought? He died bravely, is what you mean. He died screaming, said Arch. Oh dear, foreshadowing overload here. We're about to bust the foreshadowing machine. Quentin hoping he has enough courage to face a dragon straight up. Well, it'll turn out later that he kind of does when it comes down to it. But what is that bravery worth against Dragonflame? Nothing. When Quentin points out that Hargaz, the hero, died bravely, the other two say, sure, but he died, Quentin, that's the point. And he died screaming, he died horribly. It turns out that's accurate foreshadowing as well. What the wiser pair are advising here, really, is don't toss your actual life away so eagerly, just in the hope of becoming a story, which is exactly the path that Quentin is tumbling further and further down. Jairus tries another tactic to get through to Quentin, pointing out that even should Danny return, which is not guaranteed at all, it doesn't improve their positions. She's still married, she still said no, and she would probably feel even more powerful if she really does have a dragon under her control, and have even less need of Quentin. There's no point in waiting just for him to still be the one not chosen. And here's where Quentin believes himself the only wise one in the group, the only one with his head on straight and actually considering the mission, which is just hilarious really, because it's so clear to us that it's actually the opposite. He's the one who's lost touch with reality. But what he does do is finally let us in on his adjusted thinking since his talk with Danny. The road leads through her, not to her. Daenerys is the means to the prize, not the prize itself. Oh, okay, Quentin, because that's a pretty big turnaround to what you were saying beforehand. On the way here, the entire focus was on Daenerys. She was the be-all and end-all. Now, perhaps in an effort to convince himself that he's not really failed and to avoid that pain, he's saying that what he really wanted all along was what Danny could provide, not her herself. And that's a disappointing way of thinking, to be honest. And it actually plays into the exact reasons she said no in the first place, even if we're still not quite sure what he actually means by it. And the other unfortunate part is that it's kind of right when you get right down to it. Maybe not on Quentin's level, but definitely for Dawn, they did want the dragons. If Danny had never had dragons, how much effort would they really be going to get to her? Maybe quite a bit still, but probably not this much. What we do know is that Quentin really, really mistook what Danny said beneath the pyramid. The dragon has three heads. The marriage need not be the end. Fire and blood. Danny meant, we assume anyway, that we can still be allies down the line. Look, let me show you what I have to offer and why I'm worth the wait. Go home and tell your countrymen so they're ready when I do come. What Quentin appears to have heard from that is that because of his lineage, the one that he brought up in that conversation, not Daenerys, he might actually have access to one of the dragons. So here, with a handy push from Jairus, is where we actually start to click on what Quentin Martell is planning. He wants to take a dragon. Steal it, tame it, win it, we don't know. But that's what he's saying, and we probably have to reread this paragraph a few times just to make sure that's right, because it seems like an incredible leap to make, especially after you've just seen the devastation that one can do in Drogon. That, and basing the idea on those specific words that Daenerys said, that you really have to warp to fit to your narrative, and the whole thing just seems insane. Doomed to fail from the start, because they are dragons, and these are two dragons that are super angry. Caged dragons as well. There is no evidence whatsoever that Quentin can pull this off due to his blood, only Brown Ben has had any hint of that, or to his ability either. What part of his past makes him think a dragon would respect him? He's running on desperation, pure and simple. Jairus says it best, say it again. Fuck your lineage. The dragons won't care. Still, it does get our mind worrying, because if we ask ourselves, we admit that actually we really do want to see the dragons on page again. Yes, if it was up to us, it'd be with Danny, but apparently she's not an option right now. So if this is the only way, or if this is perhaps the only way to get them back to Danny as well, then great. I'm not sure any first time reader genuinely thinks that Quentin would be able to pull this off, but the possibility is still interesting. We've only ever seen Danny with the dragons being their mother, so the potential of finally seeing them with another, Quentin or otherwise, does open up huge parts of new plot. We've wondered about Aegon, about Euron, obviously about Jon maybe getting a dragon, so this could be the first mark of just that era of other people using them. 
Maybe it's not even about Quentin riding one, just getting one out of Marine for someone else to take or steal or whatever. Yet it still seems, again, like absolute insanity. And it is a leap of faith that is just not based on evidence. But what we do get is more of why he thinks this, as he replies to Jairus. This is what I have to do. For Dawn, for my father, for Cletus and Well and Maester Kedri. They're dead, said Jairus. They won't care. All dead, Quentin agreed. For what? To bring me here, so I might wed the Dragon Queen. So that's pretty much as expected in terms of thinking. Quentin, having missed the mark on the grandest possible quest, now thinks the only way to make up for that is to get something even grander. A dragon, a real life dragon, and the near unique item that Daenerys could offer in an alliance. That would solve everything, he thinks. Although again, I doubt Quentin is really thinking about how a dragon would affect the Martell quest for justice. He's not thinking of it in terms of war, he just is thinking of it in terms of his personal success. He wants to take something home for his father and for his three dead friends. Let's think a little bit about that war though. Because would this be enough for them to just pour out of Dawn and take on the Lannisters? Can one dragon make up for that lack of numbers? Certainly possible, I suppose, but it's no guarantee, maybe because of their age as well. And we know that Durant likes to play the safe game. Sure, he did want dragons, of course, but he did also want House Targaryen as well, to ensure the allyship of many other houses, and to have a shade of legitimacy behind the whole thing. Otherwise, it would really just be a lot closer to Robert's Rebellion than he'd like with them having to trace back their bloodline to past ancient generations like Robert had to. They need someone to prop up and take over the Iron Throne. I really don't think Duran is proposing just plopping a Martell down on that chair, even with the power of a dragon. That's not what his motivation is. Remember, this whole alliance was made long before anyone ever thought there would be dragons involved. So he still wants House Targaryen. He still wants that team-up ability because he knows that's the only option, really. And yet, it does so happen that actually, they have exactly that, heading to King's Landing now, in Aegon. But Duran was not to know that at the time, and Quentin doesn't know it now. So who knows how much long-term thinking he's actually putting into this about the dragon. Again, I say it's really just about him and his personal issues. It was never about the end goal of what Danny slash the dragons would actually be used for, he just wants to impress his father and to pay off the guilt of his fallen friends. He thinks that this is the only way to pay them back, despite Jairus pointing out that they are dead already and this will not change that. Quentin, thinking of the lives cut short because of him, insists that their deaths should have some meaning, which is when Jairus makes his ultimate brilliant point. I mean, this whole page, to be honest, is a really wonderful passage. But as we talked about way back in those early Quentin chapters, this is the best part. When Quentin motions at a corpse they see in the road as, as they move through the city here. Men's lives have meaning, not their deaths. I loved Will and Cletus too, but this will not bring them back to us. This is a mistake, Quint. That's wonderful. It's poignant. And it's emotionally intelligent. We should give Jairus the attention he deserves for making such a point. Again, we've already covered it at length beforehand, but I just love it both as a line and a notion. Quentin is being romantic. He's being delusional. Jairus says the focus should be on life, Quentin, the thing you are still lucky enough to have, because it's pretty rare in this world, to be honest with you. Doing this, dying for them, makes the problem worse, not better. It won't bring their friends back, which, when you get down to it, is all that Quentin really wants. He loved his friends. He's been shattered by their deaths. He's quite clearly traumatised, and he can't face up to it. Whether that's his age, or gender, or maturity, or whatever, he just can't, in large part due to the guilt that he puts with them. So he's just burying that and trying to find a solution instead. He just wants them back. So we can really feel for him, of course. That's a horrible feeling. But Jairus is right in what he says. And I love the focus on life having meaning over death. That is superb. And it's a clear message from George. And again, I say we should give it due attention. Unfortunately, though, it doesn't work. Quentin is still obsessed with the idea of destiny. That this will work because it has to. He's the hero of the story and the hero never dies. That's how it works. So we're reminded again of the privilege he has of never having to live in the real world and being able to think that the world is such a story. He doesn't really know about reality. He's a prince. He grew up in Sunspear. He's had the room to live such dreams and delusions, whereas other people wouldn't have. And we also know this is half the reason George chose to include Quentin as a POV in the first place, to play on this trope of the story and the fairy tale and the adventure. It stinks, if you recall. That's how we open Quentin's arc. And soon enough, we'll see the reality of that truly and definitively. Jairus also pointed out that there's danger to cross before we even have to deal with the dragons. Again, we return to the cell swords now. So we have the expectation of what could happen with dragons, but also the tension of how these cell swords are going to react, and whether Quentin will learn the ultimate lesson sooner rather than later. And if you're really like me, you'll be worried that his friends will have to pay that price for him. How much worse would that be if he just gets two more of them killed in his quest to honour the previous three? And yet, these two, they prove their golden loyalty yet again, as they finally reach the purple lotus, and they go in together, walking tight. One of them in front, and one of them behind Quentin. They are the very best of friends. And you can actually get a bit annoyed 
that the fact that they're risking their lives as well isn't enough to dissuade Quentin because it really should be. He doesn't give them the return friendship they deserve. He's too blind to see that. He's too caught up again in these notions and stories. When they enter, at first, there's no sign of the cell source they hope to meet. But then we have a secret tunnel opening up, leading to a secret undercellar hidden beneath the inn. And it's that kind of thing that just goes to show how the Sons of the Harpy were effective for so long, with all these tiny hiding spots to retreat into. And we find out that this place that we're in, the Purple Lotus, the one opening up this secret tunnel, is actually Zarina, the woman from Tyrion's auction who nearly bought Jorah. So without Tyrion, Jorah Mormont would have ended up being one of these slaves made to fight each other as we see again here. And it's hard to imagine a worse fate, isn't it? So now the tension really increases. Surely even Quentin realises that they are entering a secret space with probably no exit strategy, away from the public eye, where anything could happen to them. Because now they are shifting down a narrow flight of stairs, still with Quentin in the middle, and further, deep down into the dark. There's no wonder Archibald pulls his dagger. And that tension is only upped when they emerge into a brick vault and see three members of the Windblown, Incago Corpse Killer, Denzo Dan, and Pretty Meris, the cream of the crop, definitely. Quentin reckons their number one too many, because it means they are already outnumbered. And why? Because there is a fourth member. The tattered prince is sat at the table, waiting for them. So yes, most definitely tension all round. The prince, though, is all politeness as the three join him, though Quentin's at least smart enough to see that he's wearing chainmail, though he doesn't know what that indicates. He's more intrigued by the fact that the prince has come about his famous cloak. And that is cleverly explained by the prince, as him making his cloak to be such a big deal out on the battlefield or amongst his men, that for many it's all they see. And that works to his advantage, because once he takes it off, no one bothers recognising him, which can be awful useful in situations like these. That's just a really cool detail and a sign of why this guy's lasted so long. Jerris, already not happy about the situation and convinced it's going to be their end, points out that the lines are already being blurred. They agreed on two men apiece, but he bought three. Obviously, the Dornish group asked for that so that if things did go wrong, it'd at least be a fair fight. Now they will be at a disadvantage, as Quentin mentioned, and against the company's best fighters as well. The prince's excuse is a bending of the rules, this twisting that it admits to because Maris is a woman, not a man. So, okay, technically, we didn't break any rules. And that's a quick sign of the prince being more cunning and definitely not being trustworthy and also being more aware of the reality. Yeah, he's doing it because it's very hard for the Dornish to argue against considering what they've already pulled against the Windblown. So it keeps the moral superiority on the prince's side of the table. They really can't complain considering what they've done. I promise not to have you killed until I've heard you out. That is the least I can do for a fellow prince. So he's a smooth talker, but the danger beneath is well on display, especially when the prince names them as liars and deserters. That's enough for Quentin to at least acknowledge the danger of the situation they're currently in, which he really hasn't done so far in this chapter. To be honest, we've had hardly any introspection or true thought from him this whole time. It's like he's kind of skating through his own POV and not really quite there, or like he's disconnected in a way. Perhaps because he still is, he's still mired in the disappointment or failure or the obsession of finding a new path, lest he never do right by his father and his friends. Still, at least he is present for a moment when he admits that they are all stood on the knife's edge. If he says one word wrong, they'll be fighting for their lives. And Barristan and Sammy didn't highlight the Tatter Prince as a source of danger, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Quentin begins by trying to excuse their deception by being a last resort. It was the only way that they could get to Slaver's Bay. As expected, that doesn't exactly melt the prince's heart. He's heard a thousand times of how everyone's reason is the most important and most worthy of their desertion, however little they really wanted to do it. Although the examples he gives supply quite the impression of working with the windblown. He makes it clear what normally happens to deserters, and Quentin actually did much more damage than the regular turncloak would. Yet again, Quentin's defence is that this was a matter of honour and duty. He had to choose both to do whatever was necessary to kick off this secret wedding pact, as if such currency is what sellswords deal in. We can see his mistake from the beginning. He has no idea of what is actually valuable to sellswords, especially sellswords who are pissed at you. Besides, it's an even worse defence when your cause doesn't work, as the prince points out. Not only did Daenerys turn him down, she left. Plus, she is already married, despite Quentin's unveiling. Worse than the facts themselves is the prince doing it in his most sarcastic voice. And then Pretty Maris really gets an extra kick in with this. What of your marriage pact? asked the prince. She laughed at him, said Pretty Maris. Daenerys never laughed, Quentin thought. We know that to be a sore spot because we previously established that such a reaction was Quentin's worst nightmare. But we also see that Quentin is in semi-denial about the whole thing because the fact is, she did laugh. Not out of cruelty and only once at a private joke about a frog, but it did happen and it must have been an icicle through his heart. We weren't in Quentin's POV for that singular, most important moment of his life, but we know how the whole world would have zeroed in on that one second, and how her laugh was everything he didn't want. He would have felt hot-faced and stupid and tongue-tied, and as if every face in Essos was just pointing towards him and laughing at the same time. 
Now luckily that was just a brief flash and after that Daenerys did speak to him fairly and gently and then later they had their private conversation when he saw the dragons. So it's good to see that he doesn't harbour any resentment for that initial meeting or he hasn't fixated on it, even if it doesn't change what everyone else saw unfortunately. Jerris remembers the truth as well and that's the version that may well get back to Dawn, which is unfair in a way given the quick mini friendship develop, develop between the two distant relatives in Danny and Quentin. For now Quentin admits that they did come too late and that must be very bitter for him to say that because it was never any fault of his, he came as soon as he could and everyone just keeps telling him that it was too late you're too late again not his fault the prince continues humoring the dawnish free and they are truly lucky he has the semi-playful personality that he does because if it was any other sellsword they would likely already be dead and it's probably quentin's surname saving him again it's worth hearing him out just in case there does turn out to be some worth because he's probably got some gold somewhere we might as well meet him after the prince playfully asks whether the three of them will be returning to honor their contracts quentin turns the question of contracts back around on him first by establishing what the yunkers are getting up to in terms of their supreme commander we re-establish that yurkaz has died and are now officially told for the first time that the role of supreme commander is going to rotate day by day Today, the drunken conqueror. Tomorrow, the rabbit. And on and on it goes. So here's where we can really fall off of our chairs laughing because it's hilarity. Nothing short of it. Right from the off as well, George shows how stupid it is because the prince is already forgetting who he is supposed to owe his allegiance to on what day. They've even been provided with a copy of the rotor. You, you just can't make it up. It's amazing. And Quentin now makes his move of why he bothered to bring up Yurkaz. He was the one who signed up the Windblown, and he's dead. There is going to be officially a peace now, supposedly. So what are the Windblown hanging around for? Add that to the pointed question of how long Yunkai will pay for four sellsword companies that they, apparently, no longer need. And you can see that he's much closer to hitting the mark now. Not that the prince is all that bothered, unfortunately. That's just how it works. The main problem of being a sellsword is you are paid to fight. If you fight, you win or you lose. And either one is eventually going to stop the payments. So off you go to find another fight. They're used to it. And besides, it's not like it's all rainbows around here. It's not completely settled, is it? The prince ticks off all the many moving parts of Marine. And how likely it is that they will be needed at some point. War will break up and they'll get hired again. So now Quentin swings the bat. Why not get hired now? Why not get hired by dawn? And as the tattered prince notes, you've got to give it to him in terms of bravery. For now, our minds are wondering exactly how Quentin intends to use them for his mission and are likely concerned about the danger of hiring people that you've already betrayed once. Somewhere in the background, we might have thoughts about how this upsets the larger balance of what's happening in Marine as well. Yunkai will move from four cells or companies to three. A pro-Targaryen side will gain one to what they've already got. So if Danny were to come back anytime soon, what could that mean? And don't forget, we're also thinking about what Tyrion's up to for the Second Sons. But the overall problem hasn't gone anywhere. How do you persuade someone you betrayed to trust you? Even when the offered rewards are so outstanding, it's still a gigantic undertaking and a risk, as we discussed in Tyrion's last chapter of Brown Ben Plum. Dawn and the money are a long, long way away. There is a lot to consider. Quentin begins offering twice their current payment, which is probably quite a lot, which sounds lovely, but it's just a promise, and only that. They cannot actually pay them right now. Only some in Volantis where they left half their coin, and then some again in Sunspear, citing Durand's honour and resources. So the leap of faith stretches even wider. The prince would have to put everything on his side of the bargain up now, and then wait perhaps months, maybe even years, to see any possible payment, which he'd also have to complete a really dangerous, long journey for. It's a hard sell. Yet the tattered prince doesn't turn him down. Instead, he turns to what Quentin actually wants them for. Is it fighting? Is it security? Is it kidnap? And Quentin finally provides the big confirmation. He says it right out loud for everyone to hear. I need you to help me steal a dragon. Now we already knew that, but seeing it on the page right here like this, seeing that it's going to actually be real, that's a wow moment. And he's already talking about Volantis and Sunspears. So it seems like Quentin is taking the approach of grabbing your dragons and just going, bombing out of there as quick as you can. It's a route we kind of wish Daenerys had just taken in the first place, but there we go. The prince being the incredibly interesting character that he is, and I recommend you go over to Joe Magician. I know he had a video about the Tattered Prince lately, a few weeks ago. Have a look at that. He isn't even taken aback. Indeed, he sees the opportunity instead. This is the biggest ask that you can ask. And that means he needs the biggest possible motivation. What I want, said the tattered prince, is Pentos. So we've got two princes sat opposite each other and both of them are shooting their big shots. That's how high the stakes are in this game, the vibes. Although Quentin still is blatantly the one looking for the bigger thing. As big as Pentos might be, dragons are much more dangerous. 
And that's a fairly abrupt ending to the chapter, to be honest, but it is an exciting one. Because we're guessing that this is going to be agreed to, otherwise why bother showing us this conversation? Even if we've still got no idea how it can really be delivered, what will the wind blow actually do? What are the mechanics of this, yet another heist, the most important one ever? How can that actually be achieved of getting a real-life dragon, when they, they don't have an army, do they? They've just got a few people, but all things are possible. And then we can easily enter into already wondering if this is a double cross, and the prince intends to take a dragon or two for himself, and we'll just use Quentin inside knowledge to get them or are they just going to turn on quentin before they even get near a dragon we don't know but there are lots of very very exciting possibilities because we love the dragons like i say we would love to see them free the potential of getting them out of there seeing them move and spread their wings whether here or throughout the world is exciting even if it hurts to think of daenerys not being involved but we don't know what's going on with her maybe she will be involved with them again and then we have the knock-ons of the effects to the peace talks maybe what dawn will get up to and therefore maybe what Aegon will get up to with his invasion that we're going to cover in a second this kind of thing can tilt the whole world if it works of course that's skipping ahead obviously we've still got to get the things first that comes with its own inherent danger and a lot of us are guessing exactly how it winds up not well with people burning Daenerys tried to get across Quentin should have seen back at the pit what dragons are really like Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of Jerris and Archibald, he's determined to go down this delusional path with the best of intentions. It's not like he wants a dragon for glory. He's not going to sell him or kill him or anything like that. He just wants to honour his dead friends and impress his father, but that doesn't make it any less foolish. So we have just one Quentin chapter left, and it's really set up to be a doozy, isn't it? Of course, that is going to be full of frills and suspense and dragons which we love we just like having them back involved for now we're going to leave this chapter here but i do again just want to give a nod to jerris to what he said about life having more meaning over death and that that whole passage is just brilliant i think and again i know we covered it way back when but i really do think you should pay attention to it it's a wonderful message it's put forward really well and it really just, just put me in love with the character of jerris drinkwater and archibald as well of course he made the same points We'll talk about those two, of course, after the events in the next Quentin chapter and where they're going from here and everything like that. We've discussed that before as well. But that's just such a clear, smart, emotional message in the middle of this chapter that is full of delusion, full of the hero stories, full of mistakes, if we're honest about it. And that's, again, just what we know about what happens to Quentin. We've still got loads of questions about the Tattered Prince and Pentos and everything like that. But let's deal with that later. Instead, we will get to our last chapter of the day. It's one of my personal favourites. We're heading back to Westeros, to a place we actually haven't been for an age, as we go to John Connington 2, The Griffin Reborn. So, we are back after, well, a very, very long time. We thought it was a long time for Quentin. We'll increase that. Like I said before, that like we mentioned the first time around, a 37-chapter gap between his first and second chapters for John Connington. It's been a long time, and we've been pretty much left in the dark true we've had a little rumor here a little trickle there but in general we don't know what's happened we've got no idea what's happened to john connington to Aegon, to the golden company and this grand grand adventure they're about to go on or invasion or whatever you want to call it it's only very recently in cersei's chapter that we've actually had it confirmed that they made it at all they easily could have been stopped halfway they could have fought with someone they could have been downed by storms we did not know we've just been left for a really big chunk of this book to wonder I think many of us probably thought by the time we were getting to this part of the book that we just wouldn't see that, that that would also be pushed back to wins but no we're gifted with them here for this great chapter that i really really like like i said right at the beginning i'm really looking forward to discussing it with you not just because it's john Connington. i find that character really interesting if you can cast your mind back to the lost lord it seems a long time ago i know that's because it was not just because of the plot of the targaryen invasion but firstly we're getting to see a castle attack that's always cool we'll talk about that in a moment but maybe even more we're back in the stormlands for the first time since and i think i'm wrong in saying this davos 2 of a clash of kings that's the melisandre chapter where the shadow baby's born that's how long it's been since we've been not just outside storm's end but the stormlands in general i'm pretty sure i'm right in saying that so that's just amazing to me and i go on about this a lot in the castles book so i won't try to bend your ear too much about how Storm's End and the Stormlands are really critical, especially in the first three books. They really are centred around for the Baratheons, obviously, but also physically as a castle for Storm's End and as a region. And yet we're like never there at all, really. We never really step foot in Storm's End and we never really get to explore the Stormlands much. So here we are, finally back there, being our best ever look at the place, which is really a key part of Westeros. So I really like that. I really like that we're back there, that it is going to become important. Don't forget, this is technically still the royal kingdom. It's like home turf. Tommen is a Baratheon. 
in the eyes of the public. So this is supposed to be a really important place that's just been ignored by the narrative for the longest time. So that's really, really cool. So we've got that. We've got an attack on a castle, which we always like. That's cool, seeing the tactics and whatever else. We're going to see the strength of the Golden Company. George is really going to try and impress us with that and get across how effective they're going to be in this invasion. That plays off with what we've heard from Cersei's chapter, where Kevin's just kind of like not taking it seriously. So we always like knowing that little extra bit of information, how this is going to be reacted to. That makes them seem even more impressive. We've got the themes of return, long awaited return for our POV, but also everyone around him in the Golden Company. So we're going to have a lot to talk about that thematically and emotionally we're really really going to build on this idea of John Hoynton being willing to go to any lengths necessary we did get hints of that in his first chapter but we're really going to explore it now and of course we've got lots of drama lots of excitement for what's to come still for Aegon for John Hoynton for the Golden Company and this invasion that's all going to build we know that's going to be such a massive storyline come wins it's really going to leap into the forefront we get a massive building block for that here. Now, we're probably running longer than I guessed at the beginning, so to save you from another four-hour ordeal, let's jump in now. Let's get going because it's a really exciting beginning and I want to get to it. Let's kick off with a quote. He sent the archers in first. Now, what a way that is to start a chapter. We've had the whole book building up to two massive battle storylines only for them to apparently deliver neither. So we're hungry. We want to see a battle and we're not just getting one, but apparently we're opening with one, so this is great. And that adds to the general excitement of seeing the invasion kick off right from the start. It's been so long since we've been with John Con and the Golden Company, we might have been expecting quite a lot of backstory about the journey covered, kind of like what we saw with Victorian. Maybe we had to see their original landing, or encounter some problem that our little trickles that we've heard from elsewhere haven't told us about. But no, George is blessing us with immediate action today, so we have to thank him. And though we don't have specific details just yet on where this attack is happening, or what's going on, we do know with 99% clarity that we're somewhere in Westeros, likely in the Stormlands according to Cersei's chapter. We know this is part of an invasion and therefore it's really happening. It's come to battle at least once and the invasion has officially begun. And that's incredibly exciting stuff because it completely flips the table of Westeros. It rewrites the future of the continent and everything we've already known or expected. Even forgetting what we think about the truth of Aegon or what this means for the Iron Throne or the small folk going through another war, we're introducing a gigantic change into an already torn apart continent. And that's true, that's more in other areas. The Stormlands have been left alone for quite a while, but now we're going to wake it up and mess up just everything, everywhere. This is chaos they're introducing here. So it's a super single line from George to get us reinterested because like we say it's been a long time since we've been with John Con, we need a strong opening and we've got one. At the end of John Con's first chapter we focused on how his motivation knew no bounds, how he'd go to any lengths to achieve his goals and we're worried if that might include some war criminal type thing so we have to have that worry here at the beginning as well. We can probably assume that this is an assault on a castle but it's not confirmed just yet so theoretically we could be attacking a village or civilians or something not so great. We don't know the circumstances of their landing or whether any kind of defence has been mounted yet, even though we assume it hasn't, and we're actually left guessing on the details of the first few paragraphs. Which is classic George. He gets us with the hook and then makes us wait for the substance. But then our excitement is probably enough to carry us through and keep us patient. This is too interesting overall, and combined with the chapter title, we get that sense of grandeur and success already. So we'll wait for now. What we do get is some of John Con the commander, the general, as we have the details on Black Balak, which is difficult to say, although he does seem pretty awesome so I forgive him, and his fouls and bows. Had Jongon as wise to their use as he's aged, in terms of archers I mean, and was smart enough to split them between ships to ensure he'd at least get some of them landing and with his force. Because it turns out the Golden Company were not exempt from the storms afflicting every other fleet in the story, even if they appeared to have come out of it much better than most. In this case, 600 archers have still arrived on 6 ships, so they aren't exactly lacking are they? It's really a great reminder of the scale of army we're dealing with here. This is a major force. It's not just some ragtag bunch of bandits or anything like that. This is a real army. This is really going to mess things up. And John Con doing that splitting up, a clever logistical tactic, reminds us we've actually got someone competent manning the helm of such an army, which, let's face it, is a sight unseen for ages in central Westeros. That hasn't happened a whole bunch. We also learn here that they landed on Cape Raff. So we know it's the Stormlands, but now we've zeroed in on a specific area. We know we aren't attacking Storm's End or getting our first glimpse of Tarth or anything like that. Although perhaps you are like me and worrying that Davos's wife Maya might be in trouble because she comes from Kate Rath. In terms of Storm loss, 
there have been some ships either left behind or landed elsewhere, so we know this invasion force is at least semi-scattered right now. Again, they've come out of it better than most. Luckily, as we'll discuss in a moment, no one really knew if they're coming, so it's not a big problem right now. And like I say, they're doing pretty well, all things considered. A big part of this chapter is George really trying to build up our view of Aegon's army as a strong, large, well-organized force that is a real threat to Westeros. He wants us impressed, and I've got to say, it's working. They only have half a force right now, and they still have their 600 bows. And John Con tells us that in the end, they only need 200 for this specific mission. So that impression is imprinted to keep this force in mind, to get us really thinking about what will come in wins, and how much, again, they're just going to mess stuff up. So just bear that in mind as we go, because I think you'll find that that was a real target of George's in this chapter. We're still actually only in the second paragraph here, as John Con is giving Black Black his orders. We're told there is a maester's tower, so we're all going to assume that this is a castle we're attacking here, and it's one he knows well enough to draw a map of in the mud. The really attentive reader might be remembering what family John is actually from, and where their castle lies, and is now putting two and two together. But then again, it's still not confirmed. He was an important lord of the land back in the day, so he might have decent knowledge of any castle in the area. We'll have to wait and see. For now, the point is that every bird is going to be brought down, and that's an important point, as we'll see again later. We get the impression that this is going to be a fast, surprise strike, and we're really getting built up to see it. Yes, please, come on, George, give us the battle now. And we don't have to wait long for that answer, as after a paragraph of description for the various types of bows that Balak and his company use, which will probably be of even more importance during winds than now, if you buy into certain theories about Storm's End, which I do, we have it confirmed that we are attacking Griffin's Roost, and John Connington has come home. So we guess we're going to be hitting the emotional centre at some point. This is, or was, John's place. He inherited it from his family. He owned it. It was his legacy. And then everything went wrong, as we know. He was disinherited and exiled and has spent nearly 20 years away. So this is obviously a big deal, a really big deal that is going to mean a whole bunch for him. He's probably been thinking and dreaming of this moment almost every day for all that time. Now he comes back with a bigger mission in mind, and he's obviously keeping his eye on that overall goal, but we know, again, this is going to have to hit him at some point, even if he's going to save it for after business is concluded. He's not going to risk his ultimate mission for the distraction of emotion, because we know what he thinks already on that subject. Besides, it's great for us, because we get to visit a brand new location, and a brand new castle, so you know I like it. Especially when it's going to be described in such a way, by the man who knows it best, and in the viewpoint of a military attack, so we really get to explore its defences and its relationship with the geography, and all those kind of things that I love and that we saw in the castles book, so again, you know I'm really into this part. And in the case of geography, or defence as well, we find that Griffin's Roost isn't too different from Storm's End, in it being built into the shoreline so that the ocean is protecting it on three sides. It's very similar to Sunspear's structure as well. It only has the one approach up to the castle, which is apparently ideal for defence. There's a gatehouse that opens out onto a long ridge called the Griffin's Throat, which is a cool name, I think. We know how these things work, don't we? A long, exposed stretch where attackers are at the mercy of spears and arrows and other projectiles thrown from the towers, and note that they are rounded, at the gates on the other side. So we've got two barriers to cross, including the throw itself, with a cliff drop on either side, before we can even get into the castle proper. And that seems like a fairly tall task if you just read it out like that. So we're all eager to see how it's going to be pulled off. And then we get this. And once they reach those gates, the men inside could pour down boiling oil on their heads. Griff expected to lose a hundred men, perhaps more. They lost four. So please, reel us in, George. We are hungry to see what appears to be an absolute domination of an attack. We want to know how such success has been achieved. And I like to think that George is letting off some steam here. He's been building to battles all through this book, but has actually got to describe very few. It's been ages since Deepwood Mott, which actually has some similarities to this one at the beginning of that chapter anyway. But then he wrote that from the view of the hapless defender, one that was forced to run before battle could be joined. So he's still got all this build-up and no way to release it. He originally thought he'd be ending this book with great big descriptions of the Battle of Ice and the Battle of Fire, and he'd get to do all his typical tactics and logistics talks that we know he loves and we love in turn. That didn't happen though, so if he can include this one, he's going to enjoy himself, as well he should. In this case, it's the age-old problem of people becoming lackadaisical. Jamie has talked about it recently, and we pick it up here, there, and everywhere, to be honest. Some of it is human nature, some of it is poor leadership, and John Connington is here to exploit both. Griffin's Roost has generally been one of the safer places all through the series. The Stormlands as a whole have been in general, even stretching back to Robert's Rebellion. As far as we know, Griffin's Roost wasn't troubled. And we can say the same thing for the War of the Five Kings, where the Stormlords all armed up and it looked like it might come to battle on their land, but then Melisandre got involved with their shadows, and the fighting all moved north instead to King's Landing, and then even further north, and it's been quiet ever since, hence why everyone has gotten so lazy. Back to the main point, to be lazy is to forget that you live in Westeros, in A Song of Ice and Fire, and that danger can come at any time. 
Griffin's Roost has had an easy time of it, whereas John Con has been chiselled hard by his experiences, and he's about to teach some lessons. That begins now, as we have the description of the woods being allowed to grow too close to the first gatehouse. That's our mark of laziness, our mark of a lack of attention and detail and just effort, basically. And John Con again, is coming to take full advantage. Franklin Flowers is able to creep up with a damn ram, he's able to get that close, and have it bashing at the door before anyone even looks. The archers now play their part, taking both of the two guards that do appear out completely straight away. And wouldn't you know it, no one has even bothered to bar the gates. It's as easy going as you're going to find in Westeros, to be honest. They've not even bothered to lock the door. And it robs Griffin's Roost of its massive tactical advantage of the Griffin's throat. Because the forces, they've basically already passed it before anyone even knows they're under attack. Someone, presumably the maester, at least has his wits about him enough to get a raven off. Although I do wonder where he's sending it, what with Storm's End supposedly being out of commission. But the poor thing is brought down immediately. So John Con's forces are already making their way into the castle and you kind of almost have to feel bad for the garrison of Griffin's Roost at this point when George mentions some brave defender throwing cold oil over them as they reach the second gatehouse because of how unprepared they are. Hey, and who knows, maybe someone slips over and gets a bruise or something, but that's about it. And to be honest with you, that's the battle. As much as George might have liked to extend his writing of it, the Golden Company are in the walls, and they're probably having a great time because this is a momentous, emotional time for many of them as well, because they are back in their homeland as well, once more. But even past that, it must just be pretty cool to attack a castle for once. It's not like they get a lot of that over in Essos. It seems like most of that is just straight up field battle. So they are swarming through now, catching the waking defenders, shouting out the battle cry of House Connington just to really make the defenders second guess what they're actually doing. And so falls Griffin's Roost, and the first victory of the invasion of Aegon Targaryen is in the books. That was the end of all resistance. What guards remained had thrown down their weapons, and quick as that, Griffin's Roost was his again and John Connington was once more a lord. He gets a grand return as he rides his war horse down the throat, and we see the maester get thrown from the tower, unfortunately. It was probably a better idea to have him kept alive, just for getting some recon and information, but still, victory is victory, and the castle has yielded. So now John gives the orders to go and gather all the people of the castle, and he then uses his intimate knowledge of said castle that no other attacking lord would know, and sending them to check out the hiding spaces and the secret escapes. Try not to kill anyone who does not insist on dying. We want to win the Stormlands, and we won't do that with slaughter. This order and approach is crucial. This is not a conquest in the sense that they can just come and dominate all of Westeros by sheer numbers. These aren't the Andals or anything like that. They are trying to win the loyalty of the Stormlands, even via a bit of strong arm tactics, because Jon Con knows they will need dedication, loyalty, and support to not only place Aegon on the throne, but keep him there. If they come ashore acting like Ironborn, that isn't going to happen. The garrison being killed in battle? That's acceptable. The castle folk? No, not so much. So this sense of optics and what is needed long term is being handled very well by John Con here, who's really showing off his experience and value now. Halden Halfmaester also makes his return to the page, if we'd forgotten him, and as you'd expect he's going to fill in the role of their pseudo maester. So he's going to be very valuable going further in terms of information and getting across what the political landscape currently looks like. John Con might have a bunch of information about this castle, that remains true, but almost all he knows of actual Westeros predates the death of Ares Targaryen, so that aspect is really important moving forward, we've got to give up the value to Halden Halfmaester. So as beginnings go, you really can't ask for much more. And we have that confirmed because even Mr. Grumpy, Homeless Harry, is complimenting the efforts just as they walk into the Great Hall and find another feature of castles that we always like, the Griffin Seat. That sounds cool. What a welcome sight that must be for John Connington. Yet, he's still not letting that wave overtake him just at the moment as he warns against overconfidence. Maybe they could have always taken Griffin's Roost, but they took it with this level of ease because of the element of surprise. As John says, that is only temporary. Soon, they will face prepared defences, eventually anyway. We know some are aware, thanks to Kevin, which caused the timing of the chapter into question. This must be pre cerces just to confuse us. But whether that awareness can be transformed into actual useful defence is a valid question, but at the very least, this is the easiest they'll ever have it, so don't get cocky here, kid. Strickland, as ever, is both useless and clueless, as he talks about digging in here and defending this castle against all comers, especially with its extra sea passage defence. John Con doesn't bother correcting Harry Strickland, possibly because he's not planning for the airhead to be part of the long-term plans anyway, so why not just keep him happy for now? Instead, he really, really gets our attention with thoughts on the plans for the future, thinks this. Griffin's roost was strong but small, and so long as they sat here, they would seem small as well. But there was another castle nearby, vastly larger and impregnable. Take that, and the realm will shake. Wow, okay, now this is the big time. There's no messing around right now because we all instantly know exactly what he's talking about. And again, it looks like this is something else that's going to be pushed back to winds, unfortunately, but they're still damn exciting. This is no small evasion, of course. They're shooting their shot, just like Quentin was a moment ago. And John Connington is definitely correct about this making people take note and giving legitimacy to Aegon's campaign. 
He's very aware of the optics of how this continent works and how people will react to things. That's why he's so important to Aegon. That's one of the reasons anyway. And this is definitely no exception. Now again, like I mentioned in the intro, we've spoken about a whole bunch of times how Storm's End is one of the big staples of the world. It was a big enough deal when it was submitted to Stannis. That had already never happened. But now, potentially through battle, being taken down, through battle being actually taken? No, no, no. The world will watch and really pay attention, even in this prime time lineup of constant huge events, and both lords and small folk will think, hey, if this guy is strong enough to take down Storm's End, something, again, no one else has ever done, he will either be a good guy to keep on the right side of, or he's someone worthy of investment and belief. On top of that, it forces reaction for the Iron Throne. You can't let Storm's End be taken and just watch from the Red Keep. Which is likely what Jon Con wants because he knows or suspects of poor leadership, one that might rush into a bad decision. And rereaders know the eventual answer is supposed to be Mace Tyrell and a large part of the Tyrell army, yet again coming to take on Storm's End. And our theories generally point to the idea that that effort will fail. The Tyrell strength will be devastated and the path to the Red Keep will be even clearer. We might get time to talk about that a bit later. John Con fobs off Harry with talk of going to see his father's tomb, which, sure, is expected, that's fair enough, but he doesn't go there. He heads to the top of the East Tower, the tallest point of the castle, so he can finally let some emotion penetrate his skin. At this point is something we've best seen in this book with Theon, the revisiting of a physical place and that incursion of memories that it brings. At the beginning, as he climbs these steps, that is memories of his father, the previous Lord Connington. He's obviously an important figure in John's life, especially in terms of coming back where you were supposed to be and the guilt that came with losing his legacy, etc, etc, and all that his father was supposed to pass on to him. But to be honest, that is shoved aside pretty quickly for thoughts of John Con's single, lone walk up these stairs with one Rhaegar Targaryen. So now we all rub our hands together and we listen intently, because we always have to when Rhaegar comes up. And we very rarely get to know any further parts of his actual life or history. We know astoundingly little of the man, considering how big a role he has in the overall series. We've talked about that before. And unfortunately, to be fair, we don't really learn anything of interest here, other than it just bolstering this idea of John Connington being in love with him, just by the way of his speaking. The fact that Rhaegar played his harp and the phrase, a song of love and doom might stick out to us, but really it's just another part of the emotional journey. John is back for the first time in the land that Rhaegar knew. He is walking on steps that Rhaegar once walked. This is the closest he has felt to his friend in 20 years. So that emotional importance of both the day and the overall mission is embiggened even further. The crag with its wind-carved rocks and jagged spires. The sea below growling and whirring at the foot of the castle like some restless beast. Endless leagues of sky and cloud. The wood with its autumnal colours. Your father's lands are beautiful, Prince Rhaegar said. So as well as just being a wonderful description, that's his memory, that's what he's focusing on. As he remembers all the way back into the past when he was worried about what would impress Rhaegar and how could he get on Rhaegar's good side. And actually, probably Rhaegar's probably just being genuine with his compliment about these lands because they do sound rather wonderful, don't they? When Jon Con finally gets to the part of the castle that apparently has gone unappreciated since the days of he and his father, we're treated to a wonderful visual description of the surrounding lands to go with what we've just heard. Tying in beautifully with John Con's appreciation of being home in Westeros finally, and of being here, specifically in the world, the place that he gained and lost. He says this, I rose too high, loved too hard, dared too much. I tried to grasp a star, overreached and fell. That's a famous quote among the fandom, it really is. And it hits on what we were told in John Con's first chapter about the guilt, the frustration he still carries over those events all this time later. Don't even forget those bells. It all realigned his priorities, that chapter. Personal ambition is a thing of the past for him. He's now completely focused on doing it all for Aegon, who, remember, has not yet appeared in this chapter just to keep us interested. And if we really want to keep with the mounting evidence for the relationship between Jon and Rhaegar, remember he probably sees Rhaegar as that star. So there you go. Such a thought, and then being in such a place, obviously sends his mind down memory lane for a while, as we get the details of how Griffin's Roost was affected by Eris's anger, passing first to Jon's cousin Ronald, his Castellan, and then upon his death to his son, Ronit. That dickhead that we remember from Jamie and Brienne's stories. And for some, that might even be the first time that we've actually connected these two characters together, John Connington and Red Ronnet. Yes, of course, there is the surnames, but they're so far apart in the narrative that you could be forgiven for that. Ares had also taken the title of Lord, hence why Red Ronnet is only a knight. And John Con probably held guilt over that as well, feeling that he robbed future generations of something else important. But today, it's quite handy, because it means Ronnet is off in the war, over in the Riverlands, and therefore isn't here to defend the castle. John Con wouldn't have wanted to begin the invasion by killing one of his kin. That's bad optics again. It's bad for him personally, especially if you believe in curses. But it's clear that he would have done it if he needed to. He definitely would. And actually, Ronit is on the edge of the Riverlands at Maidenpool right now with Gregor Clegane's men, if you remember Jamie getting rid of him in spectacular style. And we will actually see him later in the epilogue 
him to comment on the events of this chapter, so wait for that. John also holds no grudges against Ronnet, who had nothing to do with John's loss. He was too young at the time. Instead, the blame he all put squarely on himself, and that means we take another turn down memory lane. The fault was his. He had lost it all at Stony Sept in his arrogance. So we had this hinted at in John Con's first chapter when he talked about those menacing bells that plague him so, where he said that was really where the war was lost and he really propped it up as the obsession of his life as well as the great change in the events of him and the events of Westeros. We got so much from that paragraph, that dream that John had at the time, but now we have an even better focus on it as he obsesses once again. And geography plays a part in that once more because this is the closest he's been to Stony Sept, to the Trident, to the events of that war that he was so involved in that he really affected. We have some chapter sequencing now, actually, as John Con reminds us of the circumstances of that battle. A wounded Robert, hiding alone in the town. John Connington there, with an army, the brand new Hand of the King. We already know that he failed to find Robert and what that led to, we've covered that, but now he explains why. And I say it's good chapter sequencing because it's next to Quentin, and he's a young lad, dreaming of the hero of the story. We've just talked about that. Also was John Con. He was dreaming about being the hero of the story, of the legend of a song, and what would look best in an on-screen adaptation. He was basically daydreaming of taking Robert one-on-one, single-handedly ending the war, proving himself worthy of his new title, of the handship, but most importantly, earning the love of Rhaegar Targaryen, and with hindsight, saving his life. Obviously, given what happened after at the Trident, this moment became of even more importance to Jon Con. He knew he had a chance to win the game. Take Robert out and it's all done, the rebellion fails. That is the only requirement. But he was adding in the personal glory, the one-on-one stuff, because that is how many young men think. And like Quentin, the possibility of losing might be there, sure, but it's just not given enough of a focus. You don't think it's really going to happen to you. Besides, young John thought he was doing everything right as he sent men through the town, through Stony Sept, smashing every door and searching every cellar, because at the time that seemed like the limit of what he could realistically do. That was the maximum effort. Just burning the town to kill Robert didn't even occur to him, which is a Good thing, by the way, we'd like that about him. Instead, we searched and searched only to realise that the small folk were actively working against him. And then Robert appeared out of the brothel, just as Eddard Stark and Hoster Tully caught up and joined the battle and we all know the end result, don't we? The extra tidbit we get here is that contrary to how the story of the hero was supposed to go, John did get his duel with Robert as one-on-one. But instead of winning and earning that story, he came within inches of being killed by the future king. So instead of that glory, he just escaped with his life and a whole bunch of shame. Clearly... This man has gone over that day again and again and again for years afterward. He would have anyway, even without what happened to Rhaegar, the reality of which only allowed it to take up more space in his mind. Again, he thought originally that he'd done the utmost. He emptied the quiver, so to speak. And that was even with the war crimes against starving prisoners to try and extract information and torture and that kind of stuff. He just thought, it was not fair, I could not do any more. And he was convinced of that line of thinking until, over in Essos later, his old friend Miles Toyne corrected him. Here's his quote at length. Tywin last himself could have done no more. He had insisted one night to Blackheart during his first year of exile. There is where you're wrong, Miles Toyne had replied. Lord Tywin would not have bothered with a search. He would have burned that town and every living creature in it. Men and boys, babes at the breast, noble knights and holy septons, rats and rebels. He would have burned them all. Hmm. Well, Miles Toyne was dead on. We know that. Tyrant would have seen the same victory requirement and he would have flipped the whole table to get it. Human life, morality and reputation be damned. In fact, Tywin actually would have thought this would be a good thing to add to his reputation, wouldn't he? So we again sprinkled this into the first John Con chapter, this extreme worry that we have for his future and how he's kind of taken all of his morality restrictors off. He thinks that the huge mistake of his life, the one that cost him Rhaegar and the war as well, came from him not being brutal enough, from valuing human life from not being Tywin-esque enough. And if we've been paying any attention to these books, then that should really worry us because it seems such clear foreshadowing that should a similar set of circumstances present itself, John Con will absolutely not hesitate to commit some awful war crime that the small folk will suffer for as long as it gets his end result. He's not going to risk this campaign for his own morality or reputation, especially not when we remember he's on his own personal time limit as well. So we should, again, all be super, super worried about this change in philosophy. It would be pretty in keeping with the expected themes of Winds of Winter for lots of bad things happening, and it would be another in a long list of war crimes against the small folk in this series. Okay, we can probably gain some comfort that it's very unlikely to be against the poor people of the Riverlands, but still, everyone in general has pretty much suffered enough. So John Con won't mind debasing himself and entering shadowy territory to get the job done. He will tell you that the ends justify any means, and we can guess away what might actually happen in terms of real circumstances. Maybe he'll do something horrible and still lose just for a sense of irony. Maybe he'll go too far and do something too horrible for Aegon 
to be associated with, but either way, it is worrying. And perhaps in his mind, the argument will be that, hey, if he had just done that and slaughtered all those people, then it would have been an overall plus for humanity because he would have saved so many lives in the war after. But then again, the Trident was the only battle to occur after the Battle of the Bells, so it would really be a case of straight-up maths between the population of Stony Sept and the casualties of the Trident. But that's only if you buy such a line of thinking, which we really shouldn't. At least those who died upon the Trident were soldiers. That was a battle. Burning Stony Sept would have been a depraved slaughter of the very worst kind. It would have been evil, no matter what the result was for the war. That is not the right choice, ever. And I wonder if we'll see John Con finally discovering that, finally becoming enlightened again one day. Maybe he underestimates the actual reality of burning men, women and children alive. It'd be a very fitting last lesson for him to learn. And really we get a confirmation of all we've just said in this quote. He was not wrong, John Connington reflected, leaning on the battlements of his forebears. I wanted the glory of slaying Robin in single combat, and I did not want the name of Butcher. So Robert escaped me and cut down Rhaegar on the trident. I failed the father, he said. I will not fail the sun. He seems pretty damn resolute, because whatever the overall cost of being like Tywin would have been, it's all the price that John Connington would have paid to save Rhaegar Targaryen. Even if he was the only man saved, he might have done it still, and he's willing to do the equivalent now. With his mind made up, John Con leaves that part of his memory now to revisit the present, as the Golden Company have had time to search the castle and gather all of its people. There are other relations here, Ron its siblings and his bastard son but John Con doesn't allow himself any personal connection to them, instead stashing them away for hostages to keep for if Ronit ever tries to take this castle back. Beyond them, there are other remnants of the past, sergeants and cooks and the sort, whose growth all serve to remind John Con just how long he's been away, and he, in turn, has changed as well. His beard has the right colour, but he is still a stranger here, which is to be expected, but still must sting him a little bit. If it does, he doesn't let it show, though, as he informs them who he is and what they need to do, and everything goes as smooth as possible, really. The remnants of the guard and all the castle folk swear to him, either because they aren't that bothered about Ronit, or maybe they do believe John to be the rightful lord, or just because they want to look after themselves at the end of the day, because it all ends up with the same result for them, doesn't it? So comes the first official victory feast of the Targaryen invasion, even if there is still no actual Targaryen present. John does allow himself the victory of sitting in the griffin's seat, which unfortunately isn't really described to us, and he even tries to connect with his kin a bit, until Ronit's bastard son starts running his mouth off. Obviously, he doesn't know his dad all that well. Either way, that's enough to send John Con back to business. We've had our celebration, let's get going. So instead of eating, he heads to the Mesa's Tower to find Halden, who's also hard at work, and they discuss their biggest problem while also relaying how this attack came to be. Like Victorian in his own voyage, the ships of the Golden Company were scattered by storms. Only half of their 10,000 men, which is an amazingly sized force for this point in the story, reached their rendezvous point, making it even more impressive just how easy this victory was. And John Con shows that his knowledge of local politics isn't actually that far behind at this point. He knew enough to ascertain it was completely safe to land on Cape Wrath because he knows the Stormlands are far from united. And they've basically taken a back seat, haven't they? They've not had a present liege lord in ages. The one they officially do have has disappeared to the north with half of their strength. And most of them probably aren't that bothered about him anyway, especially when he's not breathing down their neck. And they probably feel the same about Tommen slash Cersei. Besides, no one has actually bothered them for ages, so the issue that allowed such an easy time at Griffin's Roost really extends out to the whole Stormlands. John Con also believes he has an advantage in terms of recruitment. There's friends in the Reach, we know that, but apparently there's some in the Stormlands as well. Some were tied to House Connington beforehand, some were Targ supporters, so when they get wind of this, they're sure to join his side and throw off their rubbish leadership of late. We can't say if it'll be to the level that John Con is thinking now, but he will be correct on some level, we're sure. Most importantly, John Connington relays how cool the Golden Company are and how quickly they were able to land and move. He reckons this was way smoother than using any domestic force and that this was a key in allowing their attack to be so effective. These were the heirs of bitter steel and discipline was mother's milk to them. So, again, our respect for them is very, very high. We know they're really, really going to have an effect on Westeros because they've seen some bad leadership, some bad armies lately. We've seen plenty over in Essos, for example, with the cell swords. So we know Westeros at current is just not prepared for a force that is just this good at their own job. The scope widens now, as John and Halden discuss that this is only part of several coordinated attacks. They are going to go all at once so no one has a chance to warn anyone else and all are equally caught off guard. Very clever. Before anyone can even react, they'll have a real toehold in the Stormlands. They have to be taken seriously and John Con is hoping that will start the offers of friendship coming in. Again, 
like we said earlier, that's how the game works. Laws will look, is this person worth being afraid of? Should I be saving myself here? Is this a good horse to strap myself to? How far could they take me? That kind of thing. And it's even more impressive because we just keep lowering the numbers for this assault on Griffin's Roost. We're miles off the half of the force that has landed. We didn't need anywhere near that much because we learned that Tristan Rivers has been sent to Crow's Nest. That's the site of House Morrigan. Meanwhile, Laswell Peak, always an interest of those names, he's gone to Rain House of House Wild. Plus, a force has been left to guard not only the landing site, but Prince Aegon. So there we go, that's where he is, we know now. That all sounds very promising, but John Con isn't going to make the mistake of overconfidence. He's going to be as careful as possible. They still have more to come, and unlike Victorian, they get to wait. Crucially, the horses and the elephants are yet to turn up, which is a shame because we'd really like to see those elephants in action. And Haldon also makes the good point that they are the really irreplaceable part of this invasion. You can find more horses, you cannot find more elephants, not here. But John Con isn't worried about that, not yet anyway. He says they're going to be stashed for later, so our excitement has to wait, we want to know what the elephants are for. For now, it's Haldon being put to use, as he basically gives a really accurate newsreel of everything that's been happening in Westeros. So he is showing off that value here again, because he's dead on, especially on the truly important points of what's been happening in King's Landing, plus, of even more interest right now, the fact that those King's Landing events have taken Mace Tyrell away from Storm's End, leaving only a token force behind. So that really is interesting if you're John Connington, based on those thoughts he had earlier. Howden is just as good at deciphering what else is happening across the continent. They focus in on Dawn here, where John commands that a hand of peace be extended to Duran Martel with news of his supposed nephew's return. And we know what a big splash such news would make, of course we do, and we know from the Wind's preview chapters what a key moment this will be for changing the plot of Ariane and perhaps the whole area of Dawn as well. We could have scarcely timed our landing better. We have potential friends and allies at every hand. And you know what, when they talk it out here, it does sure seem that way. The do discuss how to best recruit some of these potential allies. Some will come out of a sense of loyalty, or opportunity, or intimidation, but some will need to be wooed, and Howden suggests that Aegon's hand in marriage can be the big prize, enough to entice and ensnare many, while also hitting on their ultimate objective of gaining one of the great houses that would be very useful for them. And that's a good thought, as we once saw that there are technically a bunch of options just from the great houses in terms of potential brides. Ariane, we've just talked about, she seems a very likely candidate for everyone. But Marjorie is still around. Yeah, sure, she was with Tommen. Well, guess what? She was with Joffrey and Renly before, so that's not that big of a deal, is there? Technically, there's Asha. Yeah, sure, she's married and really far away. But I'm just saying, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to look around here. There's no shortage of potential brides. You can even throw a Sansa in there. If circumstances were to massively change, there's a Marcella. Really, just what I'm pointing out is a long-winded of saying, how Saren always screwed. <laughs> they just don't have the people, do they? And that whole notion of marriage gives a glimpse to the past again as John Con keeps mounting the evidence for how he felt about Rhaegar. Because he says here he was not fond of Elia, at least not as a bride for Rhaegar. Besides, he wants to keep Aegon free for Daenerys should she ever turn up because that will truly cement House Targaryen. But it is telling that this is brought up right next to the idea of Arianne and House Martell, given what many believe will happen come wins. With that rebuke, Howden, again earning his paycheck, suggests John Con instead. He is still of political worth and he seems to be on the up and up right now. So using him, they could secure a very important house via his hand in marriage instead. And ironically, Arianne is suggested once again. John is not happy at such an idea, as he reminds us for the first time in this chapter that he has his encroaching grayscale to deal with. Yeah, a whole other aspect to all of this. And while we might hope he's trying to avoid making a widow out of someone, he's actually just trying to prevent anyone from finding out about the disease. Probably not out of fear for himself, but in just being allowed to do his job or get anywhere near Aegon. So in a way, perhaps we're already at the Tywin bit. John is willing to spread such a disease by being secretive about it if it means he can still work on his ultimate goal. Now, maybe he doesn't think he is spreading it, but it still just comes up way too much to not matter. We know this is going to be a deal at some point. We've discussed that lots recently. And actually, we stay on the same subject as John Con shows off the disease's progress the next morning. Four fingers are black on the nail now, with the middle one being black up to the knuckle. So it is progressing. This is no joke. And it actually frames the whole chapter a bit differently. For all its success, it's all just temporary for John Con. And he hits again on why he can't let it be known. He would either be outcast or people just abandon the cause because they think he's diseased and they don't know who else is diseased and we're just reminded of Val's reaction when she met Shireen. Now we enter the final scene of the chapter when John Con calls a war council and the first thing we learn is that more of their forces have turned up on Estamon. Greenstone, the castle on Estamon, has been taken along with its memories of Jamie and Cersei being up to no good if you really want to cast your mind back. There's good reason to believe that the Golden Company are scattered up and down the coast, 
which is good for numbers, but some might also be stuck on the stepstones, which is not so good, especially when the elephants are still missing. John's clever tactics are shown again to impress us when the question of whether Greenstone got any ravens off comes up. He purposely hid all of their banners from their various attacks. They're going to keep the propaganda for later instead. For now, he wants maximum confusion, and for the Lannisters to suspect someone else, which we know from Cersei's chapter has worked an absolute treat. They do already think it's Stannis or someone else, so they're going to be slow to react, and that's all going perfectly, isn't it? So good job, John. And just a side note here, it's mentioned that captures of House Estevan were taken, which we could assume, but it's really pointed out here, so we're wondering if that's going to be of importance later on. Who could those captives of House Estevan be, and what importance could they have further down the road? Remember, they are related to the Baratheons, so that might just be something to bear in mind. We don't really have time to dive into it now. The same patience is also going to be applied to raising Aegon's Targaryen banner and actually declaring him king, declaring their actual intent. Instead, first, Jon will raise his own banner and pretend that this is just him alone with some random sellswords trying to carve out a retirement plan and take back what was his. That will lessen the Lannister urgency even more, or will at least let their guard down, again buying them more time to consolidate strength and make allies both with the Dornish and the Reachmen, although Dawn appears to be the much higher goal. When Harry Strickland again casts doubt on earning Duran's interest, John Gon shows off his knowledge once more. You can stir Duran Martell, it is possible. He just has to be convinced, absolutely convinced, that you are strong enough to not let him lose. John believes he has a way to do just that, and we are likely starting to guess what it is based on earlier info from the chapter. Before that though, we have Harry being Harry, the same man we saw back in Essos soaking his toes, being overcautious, and basically not wanting to have to put any effort in. He advocates for sitting put again, and waiting for more strength and more elephants. And when they arrive, he'll probably still say it's best to wait. I really do not see this guy lasting long in wins, to be honest. He's just so at odds with the plan. And John mentally condemns him for being unfit to lead such as the Golden Company. Besides, he puts his foot down and confirms what we, excitedly, already guessed. We do not cross half the world to wait. Our best chance is to strike hard and fast before King's Landing knows who we are. I mean to take Storm's End. Boom! Brilliant! We were correct. And that is exciting. Not just because we're going to see another battle and we're going to probably see some likely continuation of their success, but we also just get Storm's End back. Because again, I'll remind you, it's been way too long. We've barely ever actually seen it and it is one of the coolest castles in the book. If you've managed to read any of the castles book, you'll know how much I like it. And actually, if you're a patron, you can go and listen to me going on about Storm's End because I included that chapter for you a few months ago. So finally, we're going to remedy that long, long break from seeing Storm's End. We're really going to get involved more than ever. Again, very, very exciting. Plus, again, it's just all the paradigm shifting stuff. The idea of taking Storm's End, that is going to cause huge ripples. And it's very, very clever for not letting the Lannisters react. Again, delaying them. They're going to have no idea what's coming. And in terms of garnering reaction from Duran and from others, this will work. If there's anything that can get some attention, it's taking Storm's End. Aegon will seem legit. There are some second guesses about doing this since it belongs to Stannis, showing that Jon is the only one of a true tactical mind here. Who owns it now is besides the point. Soon, they will own it. They will take it. And everyone will know. If Storm's End is so impregnable, how do you mean to take it? asked Mallow. By guile, replied John. And that is super intriguing. And while I'm not going to go into my theories and other people's theories about how Storm's End will be taken by guile or by force, there's lots of them around. You could be sure to find them if you look. Or again, you can just check the castle's book if you really wish. But it's definitely exciting to think about. So John Con makes that declaration. Ten days for any stragglers, that's how long they'll wait. And then they ride. And four days into those ten, Prince Aegon finally enters the chapter with a hundred horsemen, some old chums like Lady of the Moor, Rolly Duckfield, and also three elephants. Yes, confirmed, we have elephants on Westerosi soil. And you might remember way, way back when we first met these characters, we spoke of how John Con did not want ducks to become the first of Aegon's Kingsguard, just to offset Danny currently only having one Queensguard. But that is what's happened. Still, they have six spots left open, which John Con intends to use as further political purchasing power, even if Aegon is a bit more traditional about it. They might clash about that, we'll see later. The final scene we have is John Con and Aegon meeting privately. And we can see that what we've discussed before, to be fair, that this is a changed relationship between them. The kingship, or the potential kingship, has already gone to Aegon's head since we last saw him. It's been a long, long journey on those boats, don't forget. And we're going to have to wait to see how truly bad this is. For now, John Con is seeing the father in the sun even before Aegon makes his own declaration that he will lead the assault on Storm's End. So that's major drama. That's another aspect to consider. It's a spanner in the works because, well, it was all going so well, wasn't it? 
This taking of Griffin's roost and all the plans for the storm's end, it seemed perfect. And maybe that's going to continue with Aegon at the helm, but maybe not. It's just an extra level of danger, isn't it? Danger to Aegon, or just a sign of Jon Con losing control, and good old arrogance and brattiness ruining everything. We don't want to build another Joffrey here, do we? We don't want power to corrupt. And that particular battle between Jon Con and Aegon for what's best and letting the kid do what he wants and letting him have some responsibility that constant give and take that might last long past the battle of storm's end we could see that all the way through wins with who knows what conclusion still the whole idea the whole promise of not just storm's end but this invasion of king's landing of anything else is incredibly intriguing and this chapter is superb at showing it i said before i really do love john con chapters i love this one with its castle talk and its battle plans the thematics of memory and coming back to the places of old and again i'm still really interested in john con as a character and in how he's going to shape out during wins whether it is one of these war crimes whether it is taking storm's end whether it is guiding Aegon or maybe he gets cast aside or his disease, there's so much to talk about, of course. And we get other good characters that we're really interested in. Harry, I'm pretty sure he's gone. Don't forget that Jon Con's quite angry at him at the end here for giving stuff away to Aegon again. But we've got Howden, he's doing great. Now Duck's back on the scene, we might learn more about Lady Lamour. And there's always Aegon to remember. And also some really cool characters from the Golden Company, who as a group are kind of a character on their own. We want to see how they're going to do as well. Again, it's just the idea of flipping the table. This is going to change everything and Westeros doesn't know what's about to hit it. So how can we be anything less than really, really hungry to actually read that? Fortunately, it's the end of the arc for now. It's the end of John Con after it waited so long. But we're expecting this will take probably the biggest leap from minor storyline relatively and dance to one of the biggest in wins. It can't be any other way than that, can it? I don't think so. For now, we'll leave it. But again, great chapter, great storyline brilliantly framed in this attack of Grissom's Roost and everything that's going on. Love it. But that was this week. Uh, who knows how long this podcast is, but I'm sure it's too long for you. I'm going to let you away from having to listen to me for now. But before you go, as well as me, thank, thank you again for listening and downloading and all the comments and stuff. Keep that up. Keep the interaction up. Let's give a brief hint of what's coming next week, because to be honest, well, if this one felt like the end to you or the beginning of the end, next week blows it out of the water. We're truly at the end of the book next week and in terms of chapters covering not just next week but the weeks after as well there's no more misses uh, i mean we don't have any here but everyone is huge huge in terms of plot for character for cliffhangers we're really going to explore the bridging over to winds of winter and everything like that i really can't do it justice but you'll see what i mean as i tell you these chapters and obviously when we actually get there next time so we'll begin with back up in the north back out in the snow is the sacrifice asher free just a monumental ending for both a plot line and a POV, two POVs really, just to give you a little hint. Then from there, it will be the annoyingly named Victarion 1, which is actually Victarion 2. So we're going to see how much closer he's got to Marine, what's going on with him and his weird old hand. Then, well, then it is the ugly little girl slash Aya 2. Or, to put it another way, when Aya gets a new face. So much to talk about in that one, as you can imagine. And then somehow we might even top that with the final chapter of the day, Cersei 2, the Walk of Shame chapter. As if I need to say anything else about that to get across to you just how big these events are. So as you can see, four major, major chapters there. Lots to talk about as them as a group, as a theme, and just for the ending of this book. It doesn't get any bigger than this. So again, I will say thank you for joining me this time. Look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep it up. We will see you next time on the Isle of Faces. <laughs>